OK, uh, welcome ladies and gentlemen to the planning committee being held at 7pm on the 10th of January 2019. Um, I just want to remind members of the audience that this meeting is being audio recorded and a, a copy of that recording will be available on the council's website within around about five working days of this meeting. Uh, so with that, we'll now open up the uh, agenda. Uh, first of all, uh, item one, apologies for absence. Um, do we have any apologies for absence? Thank you. Thank you. I've received apologies from Councillor Churchman and Councillor Shinnick, and she sent a sub, Councillor Holloway. Excellent. Uh, welcome, Councillor Holloway. Um, so we'll now go on to uh, item two, which is the minutes of the last meeting, found on pages five to 20. Are there any comments on the accuracy of the minutes? Uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, yes, Chair. Um, as you'd be aware, um, in November, we did pass the uh, application for the former Harrow Inn, um, the house and I appreciate it had to go off to the government office uh, but have we had the decision back at this time now? Uh, thank you. Um, I was under the impression that the decision should have been last week. Have we had anything, Andy or Lee? Sorry, Chair, I don't know the answer to that without, without checking. I don't know if Lee can, can, can assist. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the decision is due any, any time soon, so as soon as that's received from, um, from the uh, Secretary of State, then obviously we'll, we'll inform members of the, of the decision. Yeah, go on. Hey, I was just going to say, Chair, I mean, obviously it has been over two months now, um, and, and the applicant, if the government have decided to allow the application, want to push ahead with building that house. So perhaps, Andy, you could inquire tomorrow or someone could inquire tomorrow? Chair, yeah, certainly um, what yeah. I'll do, um, if, if we've not received it by the end of this week, i.e. tomorrow, we'll, we'll follow it up first thing next week just to inquire as to where it is. Um, but uh, but we, we are expecting it imminently, but no problem with giving that, that push. Okay, so uh, as there's no further questions, are we happy to uh, confirm the minutes of the meeting uh, at the last? Have we agreed? Agreed, agreed? yeah, perfect. Excellent. So we'll go on to items of urgent business. Now, there are no items of urgent business. Um, however, as is normally the case, a few items have dropped off the agenda. So we originally had six. We're now down to three. The three items that have been withdrawn by the applicants were item nine, that's uh, 53 to 55 Third Avenue, uh, item 10, Land at Bridge Court, and item 11, which was 55 Corringham Road, and understand they've been withdrawn completely. So um, if you are here this evening to uh, listen, or if you wanted to discuss those items, they will not be discussed. They've been withdrawn completely, which leaves us with item 8, 12, and 13. So on to uh, item 4, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? No, okay, there are no items, uh, sorry, no uh, declarations of interest. Right, now, declarations of receipt of any correspondence. Now, um, I did receive an email from uh, Stephen Ulf, it was around about three weeks ago now, two and a half, three weeks ago, that I understand he's a secretary from Forrest Rugby Club, and, that, and I understand you received that, Councillor Rice. I don't think any other uh, members received it other than local ward councillors, leaders, etc. So I can declare that I did receive that email, and it was generally on the lines of the, the rugby club wanted to uh, highlight that the, uh, the um, rugby pitches, the training pitches, are, are uh, kept um, and are not used as, as leverage under any circumstances to build the school. As long as they're protected, that is the rugby club's main, uh, main aim uh, with phase two. Uh, this evening we'll be discussing phase one, solely phase one, but I am happy to accept questions on the, the longevity of the, uh, of the scheme, the plan, so if you've got any concerns, please feel free to raise them, but ultimately it's phase one only. Uh, so with that, has we'll, anyone else got any uh, receipt of correspondence? Uh, Councillor Leader? Yeah, I had an email from one of the uh, members of the rugby club pretty much along the same lines that uh, you've received. Oh, 
Okay, so we go on to item six, planning appeals. Uh, were there any comments in relation to the planning appeals? Uh, Lee, did you want to pick up on that? Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. Um, reports are no to but have to field any questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, there are no further questions there. So we'll go on to item seven, which is opening up the remaining items on the agenda. Uh, so we will now go on to agenda item eight, that's uh, 17 stroke 017 stroke 09 stroke FUL, and this is uh, Thurrock Rugby Club, Long Lane, Stiffer Clays, found on pages 29 to 56 of the report. And uh, John, if you'd be so kind as to present the report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. This application proposes the construction of a two-storey building to be used as a new secondary school with an intake of 120 students for September 2019 and 120 additional students for September 2020. The proposal also includes an increased parking area and refurbishment of the existing rugby club facilities to be used in conjunction with the school. At the end of the two years period, it is expected that the school will have a permanent site at which time the building will become a centre of sporting excellence for the academy schools, the rugby club and local people. So the application site is outlined in red on the screen at the moment. It's to the east of the Black Shots area of Thurrock. That's an aerial photo, so you can see the existing rugby club buildings and the playing, the pitches associated with the rugby club. The main access to the building runs north to south. That's looking up the access, so the site is behind. We've got residential properties to the west and open fields to the east. Again, a similar, similar viewpoint looking north. That's looking down from the main gates into the rugby club. So you've got the buildings to the left of your picture. You've got the parking area, which is going to be expanded as part of the application to the bottom of the picture. That's looking to the east of the site, so the new building for the school will go effectively here and will be linked to the existing club buildings. That's another image looking across the site, so the existing rugby club buildings there, and again looking at the existing buildings and the hard surfacing for the car park. And that's looking to the northwest, northeast of the site um, in the green belt. So this is the application site as proposed. You've got the existing buildings which will be refurbished for the rugby club. You've got the new two-storey building for the school. There will be a link between the school and the rugby club, and you've got the improved area of car parking to the sort of south. That's another expanded site plan, showing the car parking, the new building, cycle stores, storage for the rugby club. Um, that's a floor plan of the new rugby club, and that's a floor plan of the school. So there's five classrooms on each floor, toilet facilities, um, staircase on each side. That's an elevation of the rugby club, that's the rear elevation, so there will be a canopy along the back. That's the front elevation of the rugby club, and this is the elevation of the new school. So it's going to be a modern flat roof building, and there is the canopy link there to the existing rugby club. So the application site lies within the green belt, and the proposal is not one of the forms of development considered acceptable in the MPPF or the core strategy. Accordingly, the proposal represents inappropriate development, which is therefore objectionable in principle. The applicant has put forward a strong case in a number of matters which they consider to be the very special circumstances. These are assessed at length between pages 36 and 41 of the agenda. On balance, officers consider that the matters put forward would clearly outweigh the harm to the Green Belt. It is therefore considered that the proposal would be acceptable in terms of the impact on the Green Belt. As seen on the, the slides, the new, stall, the new building would be um, a modern flat roof building and the finishing materials and the appearance of the building would be of high quality and a similar design to the recently refinished William Edwards School. The rugby club will also be updated externally to match the new building. In design terms, the proposal is also considered acceptable. In relation to parking, the proposal is to uplift the parking spaces to 178 along with 96 cycle spaces and 7 motorcycle spaces. The highways officer is satisfied with the level of provision and a travel plan is conditioned to be supplied as part of the approval. The proposal has been supported by Sports England who see the benefits in improving the rugby facilities and they have raised no objections. They have re recommended certain conditions in relation to community use and the applicant has agreed to these. Accordingly, approval is recommended subject to conditions and subject to the application being referred to the National Planning Casework Unit as it represents a departure from policy in the Green Belt. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John, for uh, that report. 
So uh, we'll open it up to questions. Um, I'll start this evening. Um, Andy, in terms of, and we're going to hear from the speakers this evening, we're obviously in a situation where um, we're, we're really desperate for, for these secondary school places. We obviously have a planning committee that's been in place for a long time now. We have rules, regulations that are really supposed to protect us from finding ourselves in this situation where we're desperate. Um, how have we really got to this stage where I, where I would perceive the situation? We're under a lot of pressure here this evening uh, over these school places. H how does it come to this, and, and what can we do to, to stop this happening in the future? Uh, Chair, we're working uh, very closely with education providers to look a, at immediate needs before the, the the local plan, the new local plan, is adopted, and longer term, um, with a significant need for growth in the borough. Uh, we will need to make sure that our infrastructure in the broadest sense, not just education infrastructure, but infrastructure generally, um, is provided commensurate with the level of uh, population growth uh, going forward. So it is very much uh, one of those themes that needs to be picked up through the local plan. But, uh, but until we've adopted the new local plan, uh, which will, as I say, need to address this and other infrastructure issues, uh, we need to make sure we're making uh, a suitable provision in the short term um, for, for this type of need. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll open it up to members. Uh, Councillor Rice, then Councillor Hamilton. Uh, yes, Chair. Um, people will be aware that the Lower Thames Crossing goes awfully close to this, and I'm told that it could be a, in between 1,000 and 1,200 yards of these buildings. Now, the question one has to put, if it is that close, why are we considering a site which is going to pollute our young children's lungs? Um, and that really is very concerning for me on this one. Okay, thank you. Um, John, did you want to pick up on that? At the moment, the, the application is for the school for the 120 children this 2019 to 2020 and 240 the following year so in the short term the children will be on the site in the long term it won't be a permanent base for the children every day it'll be sports facilities so people will be coming and going so it's not it's not going to be a permanent site for children to be in that building after the two-year period well chair as long as that does happen then obviously, you know, we can understand there is pressure for school places. We understand that. But with the advent of the Lower Thames Crossing, um, you know, we have to be very aware of where we're putting stuff. Um, because, you know, children do have lungs, like all of us. And if you're breathing in that toxic material, uh, bear in mind it's going to be a six-lane motorway. It's not going to be the A13 a six-lane motorway, and I think we ought to really put a note down on this application that whilst it is for temporary use, that's okay, but if it was to become permanent, I think we would be against this, and the department, our education people, would have to go somewhere else and look for another site somewhere else, because if we don't build homes near motorways, we certainly don't build schools near motorways. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further questions? Oh, uh, Councillor Hamilton and then um, Steve Taylor. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I start with possibly with the uh, minor things to begin with, and that is the flat roof buildings. I'm assuming it's allowing uh, rainwater to drain off, because I always have concerns when anyone mentions flat roofs. My other more serious concerns is the road access and it mentions the parking but it does mention the road and I must admit at this stage I must uh, say I've got a statement of objection from a ro local residence which I'd like to be noted um, looking at the road it seems to be a long long road without any overtaking uh, possibilities until you pull out into an overtaking bay and as pointed out in this letter of objection when you consider the usage I think that's going to be unacceptable. Uh, if you're going to have a school, then I think you've got to allow at least a two-lane roads 
more than anything else because obviously it's going to be well used. Another important aspect I thought was something which should be raised is when I read to provide a temporary facility and I thought well a temporary facility doesn't give you how much it's going to be. On the, on this letter of objection it mentions that it ends in the year 2000 which has been confirmed, sorry 2021, which is only after next year. I don't think that's a long, long time, to be honest. If you're going to have a school, I would say until a further notice, uh, I'll take into account what the Council of Vice has said about the pollution aspects, but even apart from that, the fact that you're going to have a school there only until 2021, I think is not acceptable. It's going to be at least longer than that. Uh, another aspect, which again is relating to this letter, is that there seems to be 30 minimum requirements that the club has stipulated. One of them is about uh, community service um, payback, which means uh, people who are doing community service will be there. And of course, in close conduction, close proximity to a school, possibly not to be accepted. But I'd like to know what the other 30, what the entire 30 minimum requirements were, because I think we need to know before we proceed. Thank you. Thank you, John. Would you like to come back there? And obviously an emphasis there on the um, uh, what, what we're going to hear in the speaker statement about the community service, and is there a way that they could be obviously disconnected? It's going to be tough, but how, how do you overcome that hurdle? Right. We've got sort of four questions on that one. So we've got the first question was about the flat roof design it's it's a modern modern design approach which is fairly standard on on new buildings there are drainage there would be drainage so it wouldn't be causing a problem in the long term so we're not what concerned about that aspect of it in terms of the the access road that's the best picture the access road is wide enough for vehicles to pass each way it's, it's more than five meters wide from recollection so you can have cars and vehicles going both ways at the same time so Although on the pictures it does look narrow, having driven down it, you can get two cars passing and repassing, so there's not an issue in that sense, and the highways team haven't raised any objections to the proposals. Um, in terms of the short period, the, the plan for the school is that this will be their temporary site for two years, and they will move to a new site, which will be built elsewhere in the borough, so it's, it will have a legacy as another use, but the two-year period is what they consider to be necessary for their, for their purposes. Um, and in terms of the 30 requirements from the rugby club, the, the lease is between the rugby club and the school. In terms of planning, we can only look at it on planning grounds. So if there are masses in the lease that need to be agreed between the two parties, that's something that's out with the planning decision. We can only look at it on the, on the planning grounds, so the green belt, the design, highways, those kind of masses. Thank you. Uh, so what you're saying is basically it's quite acceptable to have that minimum period for the school on the anticipation that there's going to be another school built locally. You're predicting that. Uh, but also, you're, does the chair agree that the fact that these requirements, these 30 minimum requirements, don't impact, impinge upon our decision here? Yeah, well, what we can do under the debate, we can uh, we can obviously express our opinions on, on that requirement. Um, what I'll do, I'll come back to you, uh, Councillor Hamster. I'll just go to Steve Taylor, then Councillor Rice. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Jonathan, uh, uh, there's something in the background that reminds me of something to do with Avery Football Club a year or two ago, and the debacle after the debate about who was going to pay, and it all ended up being thrown back at the councillors. Um, basically because of the agreement between the two parties or apparently so so much as I appreciate it's not for the for the council to decide what the financial arrangements are but I'm a bit confused because as I read it who owns the site do we know it's the rugby club site and they're going to partnership with the school so that's the arrangement it, the, the rugby club own it they will continue to own it and they're going to lease a part of that site to a third party on a temporary basis. Yeah, the applicant is here, will do his statement, so he may be able to pick up these points. Okay, that's fine. I know, I know it isn't your 
thing, but I do, remembering that one from 18 months or so ago, I just thought, no, we're not going to go down that blind alley again, are we? Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, thank you. Councillor Rice. Um, yes, Chair. Um, I just wanted to bring the committee's attention to the fact that when the Lower Thames Crossing is built, of course, Gammon Field, which is the travellers' uh, area, is going to be totally demolished. And I just want people to understand how close this is to even temporary buildings. And bear in mind, through the construction period, which will be from 2021 through to 2027, there will be a lot of activities. And I really am wondering tonight whether this is the right place to put this temporary facility. Because, you know, we're still going to have lots of pollution. And when we eventually get this six-lane motorway, you know, if it's good enough for us to knock out the traveller's site and put them somewhere else, why would we even contemplate building a school in a line of a motorway? And I think for those reasons, I might be tempted to vote against this this evening because I don't want young children to suffer even through the construction side of it because we're talking about heavy goods vehicles trundling up and down. These are heavy di diesel machines. And, you know, do we really want to put our youngsters in this jeopardy so that they suffer in late years? I would suggest we don't. And that's a real concern now because if it's good enough to remove Gammon Field, it's certainly not good enough to build a school here. And I think those are serious considerations we've got to look at now. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, any further questions? Councillor Hanson. Thank you. <clears throat> Looking at the plan, and this is again possibly something a little bit different, is there going to be any traverse or any entrance access to the um, playing fields, the, um, the, uh, the arena, the, the, what do you call it, the, uh, uh, southwest, because obviously it's going to be very near, and of course being sports facilities, is there going to be any uh, entrance access at all? Not proposed to specifically link the two, but again, the applicant's here, so he he may be able to sort of comment on that or if, take that thought away with him. Okay, thank you. Right, um, John, are you right to go over to the satellite view for us, please, just so we can have a quick look at the site? Excellent, thank you very much. So um, I was brought up on King Edward Drive, so you can probably just right at the bottom of the, uh, the map there, that's perfect, and that's Stanford Road. Uh, one of the uh, concerns I have is access. So as a, an example, obviously we're going to have students come from all over Thurrock, that's generally the way it is now. You, you can pretty, catchments areas are important, but they're, they're not as important as they used to be. One thing that worries me is that the residents on King Edward Drive at the moment and Stanford Road of a morning, that's a jam patch. You've got treetops, you've got Woodside, you've got Palmer's College, all competing at that junction. Um, now, if you're a resident from Chadwell, Tilbury, probably that side of Greys, um, and you're a parent and you're in a car, I'm not sure you're going to take the journey all the way round to drop your child off at the school, and the uh, obviously round about all the way round the back. One of the options would be to drop them off on King Edward Drive and Stanford Road. Obviously, that's a main road, it's very dangerous. Um, it's so dangerous, in fact, that we t took away the right turn about 15, 20 years ago. There is an island, there is a bridge. Uh, youngsters are not, not that tend to use those at all times. How can we um, uh, protect youngsters from doing that? So obviously, if you're a parent, you, you might think twice about doing it, but ultimately it will happen. Teenagers will do these things. They will take shortcuts. Um, and, in, and in not only that, but I would, I would hesitate. If you walk across that foot, that's quite derelict certainly of an evening, of obviously youngsters at school uh, evenings, now parents and evenings, etc. So I would, for me, that, that's a concern. Um, how do we mitigate that concern? Could we put a pathway in from uh, effectively uh, the bridge, the island, uh, have some lighting, have some t t CCTV there to protect students? Um, obviously, also being aware that if we'd done that, we would encourage 
uh, that sort of thing. But ultimately, that will happen. I'm quite confident that if you're a parent, you're going to be dropping your child off from Stamford Road and uh, King of the Drive. So could we put a, a condition that that's looked at? Um, because ultimately, you've also got one bus service at that part of Grays. Yet on Stamford Road, you have quite a few buses. So again, students are going to be getting off uh, on Stanford Rose. Again, they're not going to stay on the bus to go all the way around when it's a two-minute walk. So how do we, can we put a condition in there that, that protects that, that looks at that uh, as part of the uh, planning? Thank you. Sorry, long question. It's a bit difficult because it's, again, because it's the, the temporary use for the school, there would potentially be a large cost to invest in putting that footpath in and putting lighting on it. There is a, um, an informal footpath which is just off the bottom of the screen. Um, I think in terms of highways, I don't know if Steve would like to come in, but we, we would have concerns if people were stopping stopping on Stamford Road to drop their children off. I know you're making the point about people walking through the King Elder Drive estate area, but it may encourage people to stop on Stamford Road and cause further harm um, to highway safety along there. The um, report does include a condition for a travel plan, so the travel plan would pick up alternative modes of transport to and from the site and... We could, they could look at ways of sort of dissuading parents and children from using that access. I don't know if Steve's got anything else he wants to add. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, no, basically um, what Jonathan was saying, it's a school travel plan would be a big part of um, our proposals. <coughs> Excuse me. But we would definitely wish to avoid any kind of traffic parking on the, on the, on the main Stanford Road. Um, and we would certainly not wish to take somebody through an informal crossing across that road um, if anything we would like to see that closed up if this was to become a school in order to actually prevent somebody going through that part but head them towards the formal crossing which is just down the bottom of the road or the bridge and that would be the ideal way and, would and um, the only real way to do it would be to we'd have to add waiting restrictions along the length of the road to ensure that nobody did park along there and put barriers to prevent the tendency for people to wish to go across there Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it, it, it's worrying because ultimately it, it will happen, so we need to try and work out when it does happen what, what we do. Um, it's very difficult, I think, to stop it on King Edward Drive. It's a very big road. You don't necessarily want to put in restrictions to already um, uh, cause problems for the residents along Stamford Road and King Edward Drive. So it's a worry. It's certainly something that's going to need to be picked up on the uh, travel plan. Um, and then, John, in terms of the uh, community service that we were talking about, uh, again, I think we're going to have to have some involvement there in, in terms of how you, how you stop that happening. I understand, obviously, the Rugby Club do it. It's obviously a very good thing that, that you get um, uh, these individuals that find themselves in that situation trying to rehabilitate. But ultimately, yeah, it, again, it's, it's something that, that absolutely has to be dealt with if um, approval is given this evening. So, again, in terms of conditions, I appreciate there it's between the Rugby Club and the school, but can we have involvement to make sure there's an extra layer of protection there? Thank you. If that's something in the, the lease that the rugby club say they've, they are using community service, that would, again, between the, the school and the um, school and the rugby club, we could put in, in, the best we could do would put an informative on the decision to say that this is a concern of members, but we can't, we can't realistically condition it, unfortunately. We could put an informative just saying this is what members' concerns are. All right, then. Um, that's me for the moment. Um, did anyone else want to ask a question? Councillor Holloway. Thank you, Chair, and appreciate your indulgence in my, at my first meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, my question was with regards to um, the uh, having looked at other sites for this uh, for this building instead. Obviously, I can hear there's obviously a lot of many, many issues with regards to this site, but obviously we understand that there needs to be some site. Um, what other options have been looked at and why were they ruled out? The application came to us on the basis that this was the the best site that they'd, they'd looked at. I don't know the, the background to the other detail, to any other sites. That, again, that could be something that the, the applicant could quickly cover in their presentation. Um, but as far as I'm aware, this was the the only site that was available for the for the use that they could they could use at this time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and uh, John, coming back on that, I noticed that there was a cabinet report in June 2008 
And in that Cabinet report, it did give the Council two options. One of the options, and the preferred option for any Council, would be to build on land that you already own. However, there was a, a, another option that you don't necessarily have to do that. And, and if you do need to compulsory purchase land, that is another avenue. Now, whether the Council has explored that too much, I'm not too sure. Obviously, it's an, an, an easier route to go down. But it does probably dwell into Phase 2 a little bit more, because obviously those training pitches have, have been used for quite some time. So um, it is interesting to see what the Council have done. I'm not sure if that's more for Phase 2, but again, it's certainly something that um, potentially the applicant could answer. Because I too would, would wonder that. Why particularly this site? Why particularly those rugby fields? And why not any other parcels of land? So Councillor Rice has obviously raised concerns over the farmer's field at the back. That is that farmer's field in the top right-hand corner. That is obviously land that, that Highways England are going to need. It is close to the... Um, uh, the, the Lower Thames Crossing. I did wonder whether that farmer's field would be a better location for the school, obviously based on what you said there, Councillor Rice, it being closer to the Lower Thames Crossing, that was obviously a big concern. Obviously, if you was to build it on that parcel of land, you're protecting the training pitches. But again, you know what, what you mentioned there was a big concern. In terms of the location of the Lower Thames Crossing, it is close, it is close to, to the school, but then so is everything else. I think ultimately it's the problem with the, the Lower Thames Crossing. Um, I don't think you could potentially argue that this that temporary school is any closer to the Lower Thames Crossing than, than your residence in Chadwell, than your residence in Grays, the residence in Ockenden, Tilbury. Ultimately, it's the Lower Thames Crossing that's the issue there. But I, I do get your points. But I did wonder whether that, that, that parcel of land is, is more viable for a school. And the reason I say that is because obviously treetops are looking to expand. Again, that's going to be very close to the Lower Thames Crossing. So potentially we could be looking at Sockets Heath, uh, treetops, the additional treetops, school Woodside and Palmer's College, all really within about a mile of one another. So that, that's going to be a big concern and access. But again, probably a, a conversation for a later date. Um, Councillor Rice, did you want to come back on any of that? Oh, Thank you. Just one question. Um, Jonathan, so I'm understanding the access into this school will be along uh, Blackshots Lane and then turn right into Long Lane. I mean, these are already quite heavily trafficked areas. And, you know, I've, the question one would really put is, why could it, this not be built on the existing site? Is there any reason? Of William Edwards. The, the application put forward to us at this time is that this is where it's, it's going to go, the, or where they would like it to go. The William Edwards site is also in the Green Belt, so both sites are in the Green Belt. William Edwards is sort of similarly, has a, uh, the access is similar to William Edwards, so at this point we are considering this application on its merits. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Steve Taylor, I'm just going to just, just thinking about, as you said about the schools, the other one you left out is Dean Holm, so where Councillor Rice is saying about Long Lane and Blackshots Lane, you've also got another a junior school or infant school there. So you know, the number of schools very close together there is huge. Yeah, no, good, very good point. So um, it's important we take our time with this one. Um, I'd like to invite down the two speakers that we have uh, this evening um, in, in relation to this um, application. Uh, the first one would be a statement of injection. That's from a Michael Gamble. That's a resident. Uh, Michael, are you here? Yes, if you'd like to come down. Um, and uh, you've got three minutes in which to present your case. So uh, just... Uh Thank you. Uh, I ask that this application should not be viewed as a short-term issue addressing a council concern which is a shortage of the school places, but be considered on the fact that it is a two-floor, ten-classroom facility to be used as a school, albeit for only two years of its 125-year lease. The intended future use has not been indicated other than for educational purposes. Would this be considered a suitable building for this location if it was on its own? The site is isolated and accessed via a long driveway with no pedestrian footpaths. There is also a tenant garage access road which runs alongside it. Again, no footpaths. And in addition, there is an unmade, overgrown footpath which runs up the side of the allotments, which takes down into Blackshot's fields. 
Due to its isolated position, a large majority of the pupils will need to be driven to or near the school to be dropped off. You're well aware of the parking problems around schools in the borough, and this will undoubtedly occur in this situation, not only in the immediate location, but also as far as Stamford Road and King Edward Drive. There already exists considerable traffic congestion in this area, emanating from treetops, woodside, the Scrutiny Committee of the Council has been critical of the lack of transparency in the identification of sites of the Academy Schools programme. And I understand that Transport England have expressed their willingness to release land originally purchased for the Lower Thames Crossing that is now available. I cannot find any information on whether this offer has been taken up or considered. The minimum requirements of Thurrock Rugby Club before agreeing to the school being built on their land will be an illegally binded lease document and that in the absence of any one of these requirements, any one of them, then the planning application will be withdrawn. There are over 30 minimum requirements included, including the rugby club need to be able to continue to use a community payback service. You've discussed that. And also the building shall not be used as a day-to-day -day school beyond 2021. The rugby club were presented with this proposal on the 15th of October 2018. The matter has been rushed through with indecent haste to meet a deadline of September 2019 to receive pupil for year seven for the academy that will not exist until 2021. And according to today's gazette, this does not go through, it will be a disaster as there will be no places allocated to children. I find this difficult to believe that the council has put itself into this position where if this falls through, then there will be kids without a school. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and uh, one other speaker, that's a statement of support. That's Mr Stephen Monday uh, on behalf of the Education Authority and the Park Rubber Club. Good evening, <coughs> members of the Planning Committee, uh, councillors. Uh, my name is Steve Monday. As has been said, I'm the Chief Executive of the South West Essex Community Education Trust, or SWESIT for short, uh, that runs four schools in Thurrock, including William Edwards. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the joint applicants this evening, SWESIT uh, and Thurrock Rugby Football Club. Uh, Thurrock Rugby Football Club is a well-respected part of the sporting fabric of Thurrock, serving the community with six teams, both men and women's, uh, and a youth programme that engages hundreds of young people. Uh, in addition to the four schools that Swesset runs in Thurrock, the Department for Education has also approved our application to build a further secondary school in Thurrock, also Heath Academy. Uh, I've been privileged to work in Thurrock education sector uh, for 18 years across three schools, including eight years as head teacher at William Edwards. Uh, the shortage of secondary school places that has been referenced this evening uh, for 2019 and beyond is very clear and unprecedented in my time in the authority. Uh, without new places being made available for September, uh, we, that is Thurrock in the broadest sense, and I really do mean that, uh, will find ourselves in the midst of an admissions crisis in March this year on National Offer Day, uh, unable to offer sufficient places to many resident families who submitted applications in good faith uh, in the current admissions round. This would clearly be an unthinkable situation for us all, and this application uh, represents uh, an opportunity to, to solve that problem partially. Uh, the normal potential solutions in such a shortage uh, include bulge classes at existing schools uh, are not viable in the way they might normally be uh, in the current secondary context. Four of Thurrock's secondary schools do not currently have a good Ofsted uh, judgment and a number of good or outstanding schools, including William Edwards, uh, have already taken bulge years in 2018 and are bursting at the seams. For context, William Edwards is designed to admit 800 pupils and currently has 1,264 on roll. Uh, this is therefore an extraordinary uh, solution uh, or a situation and needs an extraordinary solution uh, and this application provides that solution along with a significant community investment uh, and a legacy benefit that is significant. Uh, I would emphasize three significant areas of positive impact from the application uh, that has been carefully considered uh, and presented by two charities who have a mutual and vested interest in the development of and investment in young people and indeed the community in a wider sense of thorough. The first is that it will provide 120 urgently needed secondary school places at a time of unprecedented need. Um, it is an ideal school site in contrast to what has been said as it is completely fenced off with gated entry and numerous existing facilities. 
Uh, the second is that the application will provide a lasting legacy of education, sport and recreation partnership beyond the temporary school as a thorough institute of sport with a very clearly defined purpose, in fact, uh, and will be a beacon of best practice uh, in the authority. This development, number three, would ensure the long-term sustainability and enhancement of a well-established sports club uh, for generations to come and in doing so protect open space uh, and encourage even more members of the community to engage in sport and recreation. In conclusion, I would stress the strong partnership nature of this application. The Rugby Club and the Trust have, in fact, been discussing this for some considerable months and are completely aligned in our vision uh, for this development. If approved, we will assure, ensure that this development cements a strong and lasting partnership between one of the most well-regarded sports clubs in the borough and an outstanding education trust uh, that will be of enormous benefit to the community and Thurrock as a whole. And that concludes my statement, Chair. I'm, I'm aware that a number of questions have been asked that, that I might try and address. I'm happy to do that if that's permissible under the areas of community service, the conditions that have been mentioned, pollution, the size of the school and various other things. But I'll leave that for you, obviously, to decide. OK, yeah, just give me two seconds. OK, um, it's something that we very rarely do. We did do it around about four months ago with the uh, Weatherspoon. So um, given the importance of this site, I am happy to open questions. Now, did you want to answer anything that we've already asked? And then yeah, if, if, if I may, very quickly, I'm very conscious of your time. But Jeez. on the matter of community service, it's not an uncommon thing for community service programmes to engage in schools. And certainly it's something that we've done very positively at William Edwards over the years. And there are many, many mitigation uh, methods that can be put in place for that and uh, clearly that's about risk assessment and the level of that community service and that is not an uncommon uh, activity to take place on school sites believe it or not but clearly the timings of those things are crucial. Um, in relation to the 30 uh, conditions or uh, regulations that have been uh, explained what in fact is being referenced there uh, is a whole series of discussions that have been talked about, including with Sport England, about, uh, about the community use agreement, so ensuring that the, the use of the facility is appropriate. Those are all very reasonable uh, uh, outlined ideas that would form part of the lease agreement in order that both parties benefit and the, the community benefits to the maximum. So there's nothing sinister in that at all. Um, the size of the school is the other thing I would just want to point out. We are talking about 120 pupils in one year and then a further 120. So actually in the context of schools across Thurrock, that would be a tiny secondary school um, and in fact a very small primary school. We're talking about a very small number of students relative. Um, of course, that's as you describe it in phase one. Um, the matter of the main school site is obviously something that will come up in the, in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, were there any additional questions? Um, uh, Councillor Hamilton? Thank you. Um, you mentioned that the 30 minimum requirements are not necessarily sensitive. Um, would you object if, and again I acknowledge that the Chair says they're not necessarily pertinent to this uh, evening's meeting, but would you necessarily object if they were disclosed? That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, again in two years. I remember something two years ago where a decision was made that uh, we should do something around about now, which has caused a lot of controversy. I won't go any more detail. But that again means that in two years' time, there's going to be a commitment whereby those places no longer be there. Um, it's really forcing our hand, as it is now, because you've mentioned the fact that it's urgent that we have these places. So I'm going to imagine that there's going to be, in two years' time, a urgent need to provide places Again, so we're going to be in the same position. I, I'm not happy with the two years cut-off period, to be honest. Um, again, I have been assured that there's a two-way uh, passing on the road, which is five metres wide, and that there's no problem in that respect. That is possibly a, one of the factors, apart from the ones I've already mentioned. Um, would you comment on them, please? Very happy to chair. Um, in terms of disclosure of, of conditions, um, I think conditions is the wrong word to be perfectly honest. These are things that the rugby club have quite rightly outlined. Um, it is after all their land and, uh, and they are pointing out a number of areas that they would want to explore clearly as part of that joint use uh, whilst a temporary school and beyond that. Uh, and in fact, Sport England, as you will know from reading the papers, uh, are quite clear that one of the conditions that's already there um, is that that community use agreement is, is established before um, anything would go forward, any lease would be signed. So that would, of course, then be in the public domain. Uh, in, in relation to places in the two-year aspect, this is, of course, a, a temporary 
uh, interim site effectively for All City Heath uh, Academy before the main site is there, therefore explored. Um, and so uh, the two-year time limiter, if you like, 2021 is obviously the Department for Education's ambition in terms of the time scale that would be realistic for the building of a, of a main school. Uh, I would only really reiterate uh, and then perhaps offer an area of support here in terms of the, the question that has come up about uh, planning around pupil places. We are in an unprecedented situation in terms of population uh, growth and influx of students, but also something that is entirely out of the council's control, I hasten to add, is that where you are looking to increase school places at schools that have gone into a category with Ofsted, that is of course something that, that the council cannot control. You know, many of these schools are in academy trust uh, control and where that has happened it has meant that there are far fewer schools able to increase their pan to accommodate this, this, this situation that would normally be the case. So it is unprecedented in more than just the case of, of extra children. Okay, thank you. Right, so um, I'll, I'll stop it there. I, I do have just one question and I'm only asking it because I don't think we've had a clear, concise answer this evening. In terms of uh, phase two that we'll be moving into, um, obviously the Cabinet report, there were a couple of options. Did you have any involvement or have you had any involvement in terms of these training pitches? Why specifically that parcel of land and not not any of the, the farmers' fields around the area that have to be compulsory purchased? Obviously, you're still going to pay a fee for those training pitches. It's just Obviously, surely for us, it's better that those pitches are protected and the surrounding areas, obviously it curves around. Could it not be right next to it on, on the north of that photo? Has there been any conversations there? A ab absolutely, Chair. Pitches? I think the one thing I'd want to be very, very clear about, which is a matter of much uh, misinformation, I have to say, floating around about the rugby pitches, one of the things that I've been absolutely clear and our trust has been absolutely adamant about from the outset is that those pitches must and will be protected as part of any development on that site. And the DfE indeed and the, uh, the uh, contractors that are looking at uh, the, the schemes, the potential schemes on that field, all of those schemes and all of those different scenarios include the protection of those rugby pitches. And that is, again, one of the conditions, quite rightly, that we would want to include in that community use agreement, that the facility of those pitches is protected when a school goes there, and in fact enhanced. Um, so, so please be absolutely clear about that. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate yeah, no, that. Cheers. Okay, thank you, uh, members, uh, for your patience there. Um, right, we'll go on to further questions. Are there any further questions based on, on, on what we've heard so far? Councillor Rice. I suppose the only one, Chair, is that this is William Edwards School. Uh, William Edwards School sits on a large site. Why are not the temporary buildings on there? You know, it just makes common sense. Because I haven't been convinced tonight Mind about the Lower Thames Crossing, just think about Blackshots Lane and Long Lane. We're going to screw up the entire system of transport around there because we all know how heavily trafficked school areas are. We've had no solutions tonight. You know, there'll be, and you can see what's going to happen. The old, 13, the old A13, 1306, you're going to have cars stop. Where will they stop? We've heard one speaker tonight. They'll be stopping at King Edward Drive, letting them off to run across the road. This is not very clever. I, and, and I'm becoming very solely now to say that there's something drastically wrong with this whole application. You know, the question is, why are they not being put onto the existing site? You know, there's plenty of room there and we're only talking about a two-year period. You know, when we go talk about the Lower Thames Crossing and Gammon Field, those are separate issues. But why would we even contemplate allowing our children to breathe in poisoned air? I mean, this cannot be right. Just cannot be right. OK, thank you uh, for those comments. So uh, I assume there's no more questions. We'll, we'll open up to debate as, as, as that was the debating item. Um, no further questions? Uh, did anyone want to start the debate? Add on? Uh, Steve Taylor. Thanks, Chair. Um, for once, I absolutely agree with Councillor Rice, and, I, and I, I think every point he's made is, is worth thinking about. The, the other thing that has crossed my mind in the two speakers' statements is the... Um, the second one, Mr. Monday, was, was talking about um, representing both the rugby club and uh, the education or the, the trust for the, for the schools. 
So I, I go back almost to the point I was making earlier with Jonathan, which is now I'm confused about who's doing what to who, because I don't think it's very clear at the moment. I was under the impression from the other speaker that the rugby club are opposed to it, and, and I think now where I was clear about that, I'm not anymore. Um, and that worries me, because I can see exactly what we talked about earlier with the Avery Football Club 18 months ago, um, somewhere in the future. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. So I've done a little bit of research on this one. Um, obviously, John, come in if, if anything I say here is, is incorrect. So this is the Rugby Club's land. They've obviously been um, uh, renting off those training pitches for over 40 years now. My understanding is that Rugby Club, uh, in terms of Phase 1, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I understand they, they support it, but they have reservations on Phase 1, and they are certainly concerned over Phase 2. It was, of course, the rugby club that leased and have opened that lease with the education department. So that was obviously a decision that, that they made. So it's not, it's not that the rugby clubs support this, but, that, but they do in, in willingness. And in terms of the building, it, it can be a good thing. I mean, they don't have that building at the moment. It can be a centre of excellence. It can be shared. So in that sense, my understanding is that the rugby club are... They have reservations, but generally support phase one, but they are deeply concerned at phase two at, at present. But we're not talking about phase two this evening. So that, that's the general consensus. Um, it, it is a tough one. I think under normal circumstances, this would be one that we say, look, this, this, is, this is not ideal, and we, we, we believe it needs a rethink. But we are under a, a huge pressure this evening in terms of those school places. If we was to reject the application, we do have a huge problem coming to the council, not necessarily the planning committee, but it will come to the council, and we will be in a very difficult and almost embarrassing situation where we don't have enough secondary school places to, uh, um, uh, for um, our residents. It's something that, that I raised with Andy at the beginning of the night. It's certainly something that we, we can find in the local plan, and you do have to sit and think, how on earth have we found ourselves in this situation? I don't believe it's something that's occurred in the last couple of years. I think it's a formulation of governments, a formulation of, of council administrations that have simply uh, just not done well enough in terms of making sure that these school places are, are there. So, yeah, it's an incredibly tough one, and, and you really have to, I think, this evening make a decision of if you're going to reject it, okay, but you have to accept that um, there are going to be a, a huge shortage of school places and how we address that, I don't know. Um, it's far from ideal, but it can work. Um, as the uh, gentleman said, it's not a huge secondary school phase one. Um, in, in terms of secondary school sizes, it's minimal. Um, and if it is approved this evening, I would like that travel plan looked at. Um, I am minded to support it, but obviously there are, there are other members who, who are going to have opinions. Um, did anyone else want to come in? Uh, and obviously, if you want to come back later, you can. Yes, debating now. Sorry, I have a question. Cheers. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Well, Chair, I, I did have a, an open mind when I came here tonight, but as we've gone on, you know, I've, I've looked at the fact that Gammon Field is very close to there, where we have travellers. The first thing we're going to do to that site is remove it, and it will go somewhere else. Now, the last thing we want to be doing is building even a temporary function here because have no doubt about it there will be a development phase of a six lane motorway and that will cr create a lot of pollution and why are we allowing our kids to be part of that that's number one now number two um, and I suppose this is the benefit of being a lifelong member of uh, this community um, William Edward site has plenty of room it could accommodate these temporary buildings on their own site there we've not heard from anyone tonight to disclaim that so I would suggest these temporary classrooms go on to the William Edwards site it's not an ideal situation having this all wrapped round you know and we have to come to terms with we are faced with a lower Thames crossing, a six-lane motorway being less than a 1,000 yards away from even these temporary buildings. I think it's wrong. I think it's totally wrong. Otherwise, what we're going to do, we're going to go down the lines of the likes of America. 
where what they do, they, they go and buy cheap land next to pylons and put schools underneath pylons. That's, that's the start of this nonsense. And I think tonight we've got to be brave and reject this and tell the education people you put your temporary buildings on William Edward's site where there is plenty of room. There is no problem there. I drive by it quite regularly. They've got a lot of room there and they can accommodate these pupils. And we've got to face another thing, Chair, is that in our schools to come, we won't be building them out wide, we'll be building them up into the sky, which means they will have more than two floors. They'll have three and floor, four floors, which might even be good for the kids because they have to run up and down stairs, you know, so they get some extra activity. But I still go from the premise, I wouldn't send a child of mine and I have ten grandchildren, I would not send them to this school. It's in the wrong place, it's next to a six-lane motorway, and if it's good enough, and this is the critical point, if it's good enough to get rid of Gammon Field, which houses travellers, why the hell are we going to allow 240 kids to be housed right near here? It's not right. It is not right. And for those reasons tonight, I'm going to vote against this because I think it's fundamentally flawed and the temporary buildings should go on the William Edward site where there is room and they can do it and they can actually do it before September because all they will have to do is put temporary classrooms up and those would be quite adequate in you know, in this day and age, they can be quite tastefully done. So I don't think we need to have, you know, veiled threats to say, oh, it's going to be catastrophe if we reject this, because it won't. William Edward site can take these, and there can be plans put in place. We've done it before, and we can do it again. Okay, thank you very much for those uh, comments, Councillor Rice. Um, John, can you show us that satellite view again? Sorry to have to ask you to give it a go. I just want to clarify this Gammon Field situation. Right, where's Gammon Field on that map? It's, it's a bit higher, isn't it? It's slightly off. Yeah, it's sort of approximately where I'm jiggling the mouse. Okay, bit, yeah. thank you. So, yeah. In terms of the argument for Gammon Field, Gammon Field is effectively on top of... of the road that's been proposed. I would argue, looking at that satellite map, that, that Gammon Field is quite far away. Now, if we're going to turn around and say, in my opinion, and I'm not suggesting your opinion's wrong, if we're going to turn around and say a temporary school is dangerous in that location, the issue is, is the road. But then, would we not shut down the rugby club because children are playing on the fields there? I appreciate the rugby club's there, but if we're going to turn around and say we can't have it because it's a danger to children, then we surely have to turn around and say that the rugby clubs are dangerous to children because they play rugby on the fields. The issue is the Lower Thames crossing. Ultimately, I don't think that's close enough to be an effect directly. And this application here is a temporary. It's two years. Now, whether it is actually two years, that's up for debate. But by the time this school is supposed to expire, based on these plans, the road will not be there. So... I'm not sure, whilst your, your, your arguments on pollution and the highway, uh, highways are incredibly valid, but in terms of this particular application, I understand what you're saying, Woody Eds, that's, that's a, a separate option. I'm not sure how viable that is, given timing, but in terms of the gammon field argument, I'm not sure it's a viable one, albeit that's... It's a, it's my the only thing I would say, it. Chair, is that where you look at gammon field, it will be less than 1,000 yards. Now that's unacceptable. Less than a thousand yards putting up temporary building housing young children. You made the comment about the rugby club. The kids come a couple of times a week. They don't come every day. And we haven't touched on the point, Chair, about Blackshots Lane and Long Lane, the whole area being screwed up. You know, we have to, we have to look at this in logic. And the logic is not stacking up. We're going to, local residents re really will be peeved off, to put it politely, you know, between 
half eight and half nine and between half two and four o'clock, they won't be able to get near their place. That's wrong. Those reasons, mm -hmm. Lower Thames Crossing, 1,000 yards, that's, they're good enough reasons to refuse this application and they can put them on. The William Edward site, there's plenty of room there and that's where they should go. Okay, thank you. Um, in, in terms of the access, it, it is a concern, but again, it, it comes back on school places being an even bigger concern. Every road that's near a school suffers between those times. Um, so again, valid argument, but no matter where you're going to put a school, it's going to cause these sorts of issues. That's where the travel plan comes in. I did raise it on Stamford Road in King Andrew Drive. It is a concern. It is a big concern. Um, right, so there's a few people that wanted to speak, so I'll go Andy Miller first, Council Lawrence, then Council Lydiard. Andy, did you want to come in on anything there? Thank you. Sorry, Chair, I haven't got the microphone. Uh, um, yeah, a couple of issues, uh, and then I'll turn to Jonathan, if I may, to see if there's anything else that I might have missed. I mean, whilst I understand Councillor um, Rice's concerns, one thing I really need to stress is that, of course, the Lower Thames Crossing hasn't been approved. It's not gone through any consenting process, and therefore to refuse an application on the basis of the impact of something that may or may not happen um, um, it could not be followed through. And the well, what we in. could do, Andy, we could refuse it solely on the fact that Blackshots Lane and Long Lane are not suitable accesses. And whilst we have a school at William Edwards which can take these temporary classrooms, I think it's unacceptable. And William Edwards, incidentally, is on the edge of Stiver Clays in a country area, and the access is good. The access is not good here. Uh, Chair, I was going to come on to that point, but, but one at a time, if I may. I mean, the first point is that to refuse it because of the impacts of something that's not been consented could not be followed through. Um, secondly, whilst I understand that uh, members may think that there are other alternatives, uh, or other alternative locations, this application quite clearly uh, stands to be determined on, on its merits, and, and, and I would uh, uh, strongly suggest that you should be doing that. Picking up on uh, Councillor Rice's uh, points uh, uh, on, on highways, uh, you'll see that there are no highway objections to this scheme from the highway specialists as well. All that I put into context with the advice that we put and analysis we put in paragraph 6.25 of the report, which I think is, is, is very relevant in terms of, and, and unique because of the nature of, of, of this scheme, um, uh, and it comes from uh, the National uh, Planning Policy Paper, Planning for Schools Development. Uh, it sets out a uh, commitment to support the development and delivery of state-funded schools through the planning system, um, and it says uh, that the government's belief is that the planning system should operate in a positive manner when dealing with proposals for the creation, expansion, and alteration of state-funded schools. In other words, there's a very strong national support um, for uh, proposals of this nature. Uh, and I think that has to be seen in the context of, whilst I quite understand the concerns that are being raised, it's looking at how um, defensible those reasons uh, or those concerns are if the application were going to be refused. And I've got concerns, as I've already set yeah. out, Chair, uh, on each of those grounds as to whether yeah. or not, particularly in the context <coughs> of the, uh, the, the, the Planning for Schools Development uh, statement uh, uh, that the government's put out, as to whether individually or collectively they fall well short of the mark in terms of being defensible reasons for refusal, in my view. Well, all I would say to that, Chair, is if you look at page 41, the long-term legacy use, it talks about William Edwards, you know. So there is the site, you know. And I'm sorry, I hear what Mandy says, but I think this is wrong. And I think, you know, you're going to screw up the whole transport system around there. You know, and you can't get away from it. It's bad at the moment. Do you know, at half past four in the afternoon, people are queuing trying to get on the black shots roundabout. God only knows what it will be out early in the morning. So as the kids are dropped off and then you have this big long loop, we are building up misery here and it's wrong. I don't care about travel plans. 
because for every travel plan we create and we say, oh yes, the young kids use bikes and all the rest of it, we know that mum and dad in their Chelsea tractors will take the young kids to the school. I don't think it's right. And I will be voting against it now for those reasons. And I will cite the Lower Thames Crossing. I hear what Andy talks about, it's not being consented, but it's a long way down this route. And we can put it in because it's actually going. So we can put it in. I think that's a red herring. OK, thank you. So we'll go to Councillor Lawrence, Lydia, then Holloway, then Steve Taylor. Councillor Lawrence first, thank you. Uh, good evening, councillors. Um, I must admit, uh, Andy Millard has just said an awful lot what I was uh, going to say. But uh, my personal points are that I'm still fighting the Thames Crossing. So I don't concede that it's going to be there. And, and also here, I'm here to support all the mums. All the mums who are worried sick about where their children are going to start school. And not even the, the children get stressed out because they don't know where they're going to be going. This is short term and it's only for two years. And it's only the first phase. I do know there are reservations. I'm a mother myself who had two children. And, uh, and I do know the worries of it. And I know the worries of all the parents. And um, I admit there is concerns. But it's only a small amount of children. It's a small number. And I've also got an awful lot of confidence in William Edwards School. No way would they put children at risk to agree to have them put on this site if they didn't think the children was going to be safe. And it is just short term. It's just going to be for two years. And if it does get turned down, where are all these mums going to be travelling to then, taking their children out of the area? Where are they going to go? Brainham, Dagenham, places like that. So they're going to have one child in one school and another child right over the other side travelling and that will even cause more stress and worry. So for the next two years, I know it's not perfect, but I think it'd be okay to get us by to get sorted and get all the schools sorted out to make this a better area for all the families. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Lawrence. Uh, Councillor Lydiard. Thanks, Chair. Now, I actually know the area sort of intimately, really, because I've lived there for sort of 20 years or so, um, dog walking and all sorts of things. So just thinking about the, the access to the uh, school, you would actually be able to go into the swimming pool, go into any one of those roads um, leading up to Long Lane and including Long Lane to to get through to the school because there are little pathways and, and knowing human nature, uh, people would use the, the route which was best for them and the easiest for them. Uh, so I... It doesn't really cause me a problem in terms of access, but it might be uh, a nuisance for a lot of the people that live along those roads. Um, in terms of the pollution, at least the school will be on the right side of the of the road of the you know the the sort of uh, uh, Thames crossing, because it's being on on the west side of it, you get less pollution because of the prevailing winds and stuff like that so I don't have too much of a problem with that's concerned. From what I understand it's going to be a major benefit long term to the uh, rugby club. The only thing that does bother me is that uh, I'm not happy where there's a bar and a school. You know, Traditionally rugby club members have used the bar quite heavily and I'm not sure whether they'll be driving out of there in a good state. So that, that does concern me a little bit. I will be voting for it, um, but I'll have my reservations. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Holloway. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say I think I agree with you with regards to your earlier comments on how have we got into this situation? Um, I, I just can't really understand how there wasn't some planning. We, we must have known that there were going to be 120, 240 students over the next couple of years that were going to need places. And it appears like at the end of last year, they went, oh, we really should sort this out before March. And how this application can come then in January, um, 
I, you know, I understand that all planning decisions have an element of difficulty and there are difficulty, but I don't really appreciate having an application in front of me where I'm actually having my arm twisted and then it's threats of either you put this through or there's children with no school places and it's a very very uncomfortable way to make planning decisions to be honest and I don't I, you know I don't think oversized classrooms are not good that's not what young people need it's an absolute disgrace that that can even be considered and, and I think what's also upsetting about this site um, is that you know, having a, having a classroom and being in secondary school isn't just about the classroom that you're sitting in. It's about the whole school of all years um, and all of that in, entailment. It's not just about being in the classroom for the classes you need. It's interacting with um, all of the years right up until year 11. Um, and there's a mentoring and uh, ele element of being in that school environment. So this doesn't appear like this is a very good situation for the young people attending the, the, the site either. So reluctantly, um, the threats have worked, I think, and, and that's for the sake of, of the young people needing to be educated and not being stuffed into classrooms, whereas I can see that the that, that other sites aren't going to be considered. That's all, Chair. Okay, uh, Steve Taylor and then Councillor Hamilton. Thanks, Chair. Um, Unusually, I'm not wearing the green belt hat at the moment because that isn't an issue for me where this site's concerned. Uh, and as I say, I very much support what Councillor Rice is saying. Looking at that aerial map, anyone who isn't familiar with it, the loop on the left is a 400 metre running track. The little road that comes off of the 1306 that goes to the Travellers site is that's the one. So at the top of the picture there, it actually turns at sort of 90 degrees and goes directly to that site. So if you unravel that track, which is about 400 metres, and you sort of imagine they laying that out, I don't think it's anywhere near 1,000 metres away to where the, the gammon field is, just, just as a matter of reference if anybody doesn't know it. The, the other thing that springs to mind is in Thurrock, in my, and I've lived here all my life, um, so many things that have come up that have been temporary um, that have been temporary for 40, 50 and 60 years. So as an example, Dean Holm School was a temporary school built after the war and it's still there. Now I don't have an issue with that but, but my view is that once this has happened um, you think of the use of the pits down at, at Averley and how that went on year after year after year and every five years they came back for another five years. So. As soon as somebody says it's temporary, I am incredibly suspect. I don't think this is temporary at all. This is going to this is going to come out of the closet on a regular basis to deal with the same issue. And, and finally, again in support of what Councillor Rice is saying, it, surely to put those buildings on an existing school where you have shared resources has to make more sense than creating a brand new school where you have to provide all sorts of resources that where you could possibly use a lot of the resources that already exist at, as, as an example, William Edwards. So just that, that's, you know, I'm not going to say any more than that, but they're the things that really come to mind. There's the temporary bit, why not use the existing resources on another site and so on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. I'll make it short and sweet in that initially I was thinking of a broom because I don't think there's going to be a problem. But after tonight, unfortunately, hearing what Councillor Rice said and his uh, adjacent partner, it is, it is something which I think smacks of desperation. I don't like to be rail railroaded into something, but it's popped up with the fact that uh, if we don't do this, then, and the consequences will be horrendous, the repercussions would be uh, terrible, which is possibly true. But I don't think, again, the fact that that is a consequence of rejection tonight should influence the fact that, unfortunately, I am, while initially approving, I am against it because of various reasons, the congestion to begin with, possibly. The fact that what starts off as temporary has been mentioned could uh, become semi-permanent, which, for my idea, would be an ideal thing. That is a, a good, a good thing to have that because at the moment it's down for two years and that's it. So even now we've got to be considering construction in two years' time for a school. I can't think any more than that. And, and to be honest, um, but as I say, initially I was.
thinking there's no reason for rejecting, but after tonight, unfortunately, I have got to go down that path. Thank you. Okay, uh, any further members wanted to wait? No? Okay. So uh, thank you very much, members, for that. I think it was a really good debate, and I, thought, I think we've really hit all angles of this particular project. Oh, sorry, John, did you want to come in there? Let's sorry. just have a, a couple of points. Um, in terms of the, the highways issues, which a number of members have raised, because it is the two-year permission, that would only be um, used as a school, a permanent school for those two years. The travel plan condition would cover those issues, and the highways team have raised no objections. Um, in terms of a bit of housekeeping, the application has been made by the Education Trust and the Rugby Club, so it's a joint application between the two parties. And members are looking at the, the issue of the temporary use of the school. It's a, going to be a permanent building. There will be a permanent sporting legacy as a result of this. Um, if you look at conditions 18, it's clubhouse refurbishment, so you get better facilities for the rugby club in the future. Um, in condition 19, looking at shared facilities and how those will be used in the future. Um, and condition 20, how the build, again, how the building will be used in the future. It will be of wider benefits once the school use has been removed from the building, so wider sporting legacy, supporting council's aspirations for health, fitness, reducing obesity. So all these are wrapped up in the sort of end use once the school has moved from the site. So it's whilst members are considering the school use and raising some concerns about it, those concerns are covered by the conditions and there is a, a wider use in the future that will see benefits for, for this academy, for the local community and the rugby club. And arguably some of those benefits that the rugby club would receive wouldn't be there if this building wasn't being built by the school. Okay, thank you. Councillor Rice, did you want to come in there? Yeah, just a couple of comments. Um, Councillor Holloway makes a very valid point. In, in year one, which will be September, they have 120 children totally divorced from William Edwards. That cannot be right. can't be right. Those kids ought to be within the William Edwards site. And I still come back to this. There is enough room on that site to put temporary buildings up. Because all these, this is going to be is a temporary site. You know, now we're being sold this on the basis if there's going to be some long-lasting benefit to the rugby club. Well, I, I don't buy that. And I don't buy the short-term permission. Because I think the short-term permission will be a long-term permission. They'll come back every couple of years saying, well, we've got no land, we can't do this, we can't do that. And it'll be pushed on us again. I think we stop this before it starts. And with respect, on the Lower Thames Crossing, there's a full application going to the Secretary of State. We know that. Yes, it might not be passed at this stage, but we all know where roads go. They tend to be passed. So, and the very fact that Gammon Field is being removed through that construction period, that should tell us plenty why would we endanger our children to pollute their, their young lungs through poison? You know, it's different when you go there perhaps once or twice a week. That's totally different. You're going there <coughs> every day and you're being divorced from the main school, which is at William Edwards. This should be, should be at the William Edwards site. There is no excuse why it cannot go there. And I think for those reasons, we ought to be turning this down and sending a, a strong message to our educational people. Pull your socks up, get over to William Edwards and get it sorted out. That's a country area. What we're talking about is the residents of Blackshots Lane and Long Lane, they'll be up in arms. We're not talking about one or two cars. You're talking about hundreds at peak times. This is unacceptable. These are small roads. These aren't, these aren't the old A13. You know, they're not big roads. They cannot cope with this amount of traffic unless we want to gridlock the whole of our area. 
Now, if we put them on the William Edwards site, it's a country area, there's enough area there to actually drop children off in safety. And I've driven by there many times, uh, early in the morning, and obviously collection points, and there doesn't tend to be a problem because it's on that remote area, countryside. This is in the middle of a built-up area. For those reasons, it's wrong, and we should stop this before it even starts. It's fundamentally wrong. And when we come to the Lower Thames Crossing, why would you put even a temporary position next to a six-lane motorway? We could be on drugs in this room if we pass this tonight. It's terrible, absolutely disgraceful that it's even coming to us. And these veiled threats, if we don't do it, this will happen. Get down to William Edwards' site and put your temporary buildings on there. There is the room and it can be done. OK, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Rice. Um, I, I have responded, I think, to a few, a few of your comments there in, in terms of um, uh, the lower Thames crossing, etc. Um, in terms of the application itself, does anyone want to speak before I sum up, by the way? No, anyone want to debate? No? Um, so we'll shortly head to, to the vote. So I said it earlier and I'll say it again. This is, this is far from ideal. Um, I think Councillor Holloway summed it up very well in terms of having our arms twisted in, in certain situations and it being completely unfair. It is. Um, we need to sort of work out how we, we can avoid this sort of situation in the future. Um, in terms of the comments over the highways officers, that's always a difficult one. We, we have this every month where we turn around to highways officers and say, you're building too many roads, there's not enough car parking, there's not enough access. If the highways officers give it the green light, but it's a very difficult situation because it goes to appeal and, and effectively the inspector just laughs at us and says, well, why are you going against the advice of your professional officers? So it, it's always a tough one. It's something that can be looked at at a local plan. We say it a lot, but we really need to take it seriously this time around. Um, one thing I think that has come out of this evening is actually the, the location of the, of the temporary school. This is phase one, we have phase two potentially uh, in the future and if we think phase one's a concern then that's absolutely nothing on, on, on the size of phase two. Um, Andy, I'm not saying that we're going to vote in favour or, or against it. Um, I, I personally would like to reopen the conversation of have we chosen the right location in terms of those training pitches for this particular school. I've had a look at the draft plans for um, at phase two. I must admit I don't like the look of them. They're very heavy centric on, on, on Stamford Road and King Edward Drive. I'm not saying don't build it there, but can we reopen the conversation? Can we send a message to uh, whomever's in charge of phase two that actually have you got those training pitches correct? Have you discussed with Highways England over their compulsory purchase land? Is the farmer's field to the north, directly north of that site, viable? I appreciate we don't own it. I appreciate it's going to cost. But um, if, it, if it solves us problems, then it's certainly something that I'd like to look at. In terms of uh, Stamford Road, uh, we do have uh, potentially uh, an additional school next to treetops coming. And I do wonder whether you could have a roundabout at the north of that uh, road that feeds into potentially the Orsett Heath Academy and uh, directly into um, uh, treetops to alleviate the pressure on, on Stamford Road and King Edward Drive. Just a suggestion, just an idea, it's going to need a, a lot of thought. It does potentially bring a, a school a slightly closer to uh, the potential um, Highways England, but ultimately one of the big problems we've got is, is those training pitches. So how can we open that conversation again? I'm not saying do it, I'm just saying can we just double check to make sure that the, the Phase 2, when it does come, we, we've got the right site and there's no possible alternative to, to what? route we're looking at. Chair, yep, yeah, very clear. Um, and of course the education provider, the education authority and the education portfolio holder are all in the room listening to, 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 to that as well and we can certainly pick up that debate. The one thing I need to stress though clearly, and, and, and I know you know this is the case, but I need to make the point is that obviously that's out with what you're considering this evening. This application is, is there in front of you to be determined um, on its merits this evening. Um, but those uh, wider points and those wider conversations uh, can and will be picked up. Thank you. OK, thank you. And under the travel plan, instead of an additional condition, you've picked up on the comments and concerns over King Edward Drive, Stamford Road, um, and potential access across that field to uh, the temporary school and, and the concerns that can be arise. That has to be double-checked on, on the travel plan, yeah? We could look at that, Chair, whether or not that could be included or not for the reasons that have been set out, but certainly we'll, we will look at that as part and parcel of the um, uh, approval of the, 
uh, travel plan through the conditions, yes. Okay, thank you. So um, I've, I've said everything that I wanted to say on this particular application. Um, as, a, as I said, it's far from ideal. Um, this is a joint application with the rugby club, so uh, there's certainly been some uh, or a lot of communication between them and education. It can potentially turn out to be a really good thing, this temporary building, if it is temporary and it is handed over to both the potential secondary school and Thurrock Rugby Club for, for future use. Um, it is far from ideal, but um, as, as Councillor Holloway put it, we, we are unfortunately in this, this real difficult situation. Not necessarily our fault on planning, but, but I do think we have to accept a certain amount of responsibility in terms of the, the local plan that we have, the, the constraints we put ourselves under, and, and, and the amount of money that's coming from, from, from new houses we're building. Obviously, somewhere uh, we're getting it wrong. So um, with that, I've got nothing else to say. Uh, did anyone else want to comment before we go to the vote? No, okay, so there is a, a recommendation, uh, that's uh, 8.1, uh, we've got, do we have to go to two votes there, or is it just uh, one whole, one to the secondary estate, and B with conditions? Um, Chair, you need to take a vote on, on the uh, substantive part of the recommendation, I approval, um, subject to the conditions set out, and if that is carried, then it will then uh, need to be referred to the Secretary of State through the National Planning Casework Unit. Okay, thank you. So um, the recommendation 8.1 is on page 46 for approval. I'll recommend that. Is that seconded? Uh, Councillor Lydiard seconds that. And that's uh, grant planning and administration section subject to a referral to Secretary of State. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Okay, and all those against? Okay, thank you. Uh, Tisha, you've got that, yeah? Perfect. All right, so with that, we can confirm that application 18 stroke 017 stroke 09 FUL has been approved. Andy, did you want to come in on B, or is that it now? We just. Excellent, okay. All right, then. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I think we covered all bases there with that particular application. Um, we'll now move on to the rest of the agenda. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we go straight down to item agenda 12 which is uh, the town centre for car park King Street obviously if anyone's here for the rugby cup application you're more than welcome to uh, leave um, and that's found on pages 95 to 126 um, Chris would you like to present a report please thank you thank you the site is located in Stanford Town Centre along King Street and this application seeks full planning permission for the construction of a mixed use development comprising of two commercial units on the ground floor level and 47 residential units on the upper floors of the proposed building together with Undercroft um, area for surface car parking um, as well as an outside parking area uh, for a total of 53 parking spaces. The building would be part three, part four, part five storeys high of a modern design and we're front onto King Street and project along the street block to the corner with the High Street. So the application uh, site is shown red on the plan, uh, which includes um, part of the car park, but not all of the car park, where the mouse cursor is shown. That area is outside of the application site. Um, it's etched blue on some plans, which means it's within the, within the ownership of the applicant, as well as obviously the red line being within the ownership of the applicant, but we are dealing with the uh, red line part of this um, scheme and the, out, uh, the car park area outside the red line will remain um, for public car parking use um, as existing. So an aerial photo shows the wider area in terms of uh, Stanford La Hope Town Centre, uh, King Street, the High Street, uh, St Mar Margaret's Church on the hill there, that's um, a Grade 1 listed building uh, within the vicinity. Uh, we also can see to the um, uh, left of the screen is the Stanford La Hope um, railway station and bus uh, location uh, areas as well with residential surrounding. So existing uh, layout plan as shown um, in terms of the parking space is shown there. The access to the site at present, you come along High Street and you do a right into the site where you access the car park. And If you wanted to leave the car park, you ex exit back onto King Street. It has a one-way system uh, in terms of the road public highway as well as the site itself. There is a derelict building um, towards the eastern half of the site and there's some trees surrounding the, that boundary um, and some within the site as well, um, two of those being uh, trees of tree preservation order with, with tree preservation orders. 
so existing elevations uh, shows that so that shows the looking from King Street um, you've got the existing building there um, and there's the trees I mentioned and there's the car park which forms a gap between obviously built form of the existing building and uh, existing buildings outside of the site within King Street and the bottom one shows uh, the view from the high street you note the land does start to rise up towards the high street area uh, towards the vicinity of the church uh, to the west there, to, to the right of the screen is the um, King Street um, relationship in the street scene there's a series of photographs now to show the site as it is at present um, so that shows looking from King Street towards uh, the site you can see the church in the, in the background um, and then commercial units along King Street and that's another view that's taken from the crossing um, and actually that view there is quite important because the church uh, would still be viewable from this point even if planning permission was granted for this development so it would not interrupt that view of the church um, uh, and you still see the views through the, from there the central part of the King Street uh, so looking towards um, the car park and the buildings in the background are those that three storey buildings uh, that front on to the high street they're probably more than three storey at the back there um, as the high street ground level rises and then a series of photographs to show the views from within the car park and the top one there is the access um, so if you're coming into it you'll come down that hill into the car park and the bottom one's the access out onto King Street and that's top one's the view from the high street of the access going in and uh, along the eastern boundary of the high street where those trees are that would all be removed uh, some more of those trees, they're Leylander type trees they're not protected those trees and that's the, the uh, vacant building on the site some wider pictures of the area, so I mentioned the three storey and the ground level changes um, in the top left of the site, that's the, sorry, top left, that's the high street uh, and so is that the bottom part of the high street opposite the site, there are those trees I mentioned that on the boundary and the bottom ones are showing uh, the streetscape of um, King Street, so that's looking at the southern side and that's the northern side where again the three storeys with commercial on the ground floor um, in that location. The pros layout plan shows the building would occupy um, the block area as shown here with underground parking, um, two retail, sorry, two commercial units and one flat in the corner there. There's a bit more zoomed in version of the ground floor coming in a moment. Um, but the access in and out remains the same as does the, the area into the existing public car park. These three parking spaces, although they're in the site, they would be part of the public car park in the future. A barrier system would be installed for this area to be used for residential car parking along with residential parking and parking for the commercial units for the staff etc within um, that building. In fact if I zoom in and we look at the layout plan of the building we can see a bit more in detail there. So there's a bin store in this location, there's a return frontage of the commercial units there, that's the second unit. Uh, the core areas where the lifts and stairwells up to the upper floors are, are shown as well addition to the park and there's that ground floor flat um, and there's cycle storage proposed in there as well. First and floor and second floor re represent the same in terms of layout of flats and the third floor there's a communal garden area on the corner there. Uh, that was come about through the application process. There was a flat there originally but to maintain the views of the church from that zebra crossing point I showed in that photograph uh, that would be an open communal garden area there so you'd still maintain that those views and the top floor of the building um, with the roof area as well um, so it's, um, it pitches up um, sorry the, the highest part of the building is to the eastern side uh, where there's five store it reaches five story with these residential units uh, the roof area is in fact is the top of the four, four stories uh, with solar panels shown for uh, renewable energy and the terrace there that's the one at the third floor level so it steps down there from the street scene the parking layout, as I mentioned, um, just shows this in a bit more detail uh, in terms of the colour coding. So, existing car park outside of the site, so not for consideration, but that will remain as it is, uh, and that's the parking shown within the site, um, as mentioned. And just to clarify, in terms of uh, the existing car parking position at the site, um, so within the red line, um, doesn't show this is not the existing plan, but the existing plan showed there were 67 spaces. Uh, and outside this area here there's 40 so in total there's 107 at present 
The park composition after development, if planning permission is granted, um, would change from 50 to 56 spaces. Three of those spaces would become the public car park, so 53 for development. Um, and then the 40 would remain, as, as shown, within the outside parking. So there would be revisions to the car park. Um, um, so 43 parking spaces for the public car park um, and parking for the uh, rest of the development, the 53 for the serving the development. Elevations to show the building. So it is slightly higher than um, surrounding buildings. You've got three-storey buildings opposite this site. Um, they're two-storey, pitch-roofed, uh, early 19th century, early 1900 buildings along uh, to the west of the site and as you can see it steps up towards the corner where the, the road frontage is. That's um, there's actually a wider gap than shown there, that's just given some indication, doesn't quite show but um, it's a bit of a wider gap in the street scene than shown there and as you can see in terms of relation to the high street where the ground level rises, the four storey element is pretty much level with that. So because the ground level is on the site, the ground floor is excavated to some extent to create the car park, um, but it's ground floor level on King Street, and that helps with the height of the four-storey element, and there's just a, um, some elements that's uh, five-storey towards the eastern side. Some more elevations to show the site in, in that regard, um, and the roof terrace, as that's mentioned there, that's shown on the uh, western corner of the building. Now, you'll probably see from the planning history, there was uh, a planning permission granted in 2012 uh, for a similar development on this site. That was for 22 flats and a ground floor uh, supermarket use. That permission has now lapsed and has expired. But the red line shown on that plan indicates the height parameter of that consented scheme from 2012. So as you can see, this scheme is not as tall in, in height or scale. Uh, and is considered a far more uh, um, impressive uh, design than the previous scheme, much more, um, it's a modern design, but it's considered acceptable in design grounds, and um, our urban design advisor has been involved through the process of this application and has no objections to the current design of the scheme. We now have a series of 3D illustrative perspectives. Um, as you can see from various angles, that shows the site in relation to the surrounding uh, development and that's another one from King Street looking west a bit more zoomed in immediately where the crossing point is I mentioned and that's that view of the church which I mentioned earlier as well being retained so another view from King Street that's looking east this time um, towards the high street uh, that's the access area where you would be leaving the public car park and the car park to the site and that's from the uh, back of the site, if you like, that's from the uh, where the pub is, uh, the back of the Rising Sun pub looking uh, towards the site. Um, one of the concerns early on in the application was its, con its impact on the skyline of Stanford La Hope and making sure the, uh, the building itself didn't compete with the uh, Grade 1 listed church. Um, now, the reduction in height from when the application was originally in, which was slightly higher than this, I think it was another story in height, um, has now obviously been improved to address that concern officers had originally so we're now at five stories in heights you can see the church on the photograph and this area here indicates the proposed building so it's not projecting above um, the general horizon here there are other buildings as you can see that um, with the ground level changes um, from from this location and this is taken from the manor way roundabout looking towards stanford across the railway as you can see so, in summary, the proposal is considered to regenerate this uh, town centre site um, instead of it being used as a car park. It would provide additional ground floor units for the benefit of the town centre and help fill in that gap between King Street and the High Street where there's uh, a car park at present and there's not that continuation of retail or commercial uses. Quite important to continue that along there in relationship of the general town centre itself. Um, in terms of the upper levels of the building, so we, we would achieve 47 residential units which benefit from obviously good access. You mentioned the train station, it's a town centre site in terms of amenity provision, uh, essential goods and services. Um, it would also provide a policy compliant level of affordable housing, so that's 35% of this development and that um, is 16 units. Uh, high quality design development as I've already mentioned um, and would retain public car parking spaces, those that are outside of the site 
Um, so in total we'd have 30, 43 public car parking spaces still to be used for the town centre benefit. Um, and the development itself meets the council's um, draft parking standards for its end use, so it's one for one on residential units. Um, and the dwelling mix is shown in the report. So the recommendation is to approve subject to planning obligations, um, so financial contributions to education, highways, and the affordable housing provision would be your planning obligations um, secured through a section 106 agreement. And there are 19 planning conditions as set out in the report. Um, just before I finalise, there is a, some change to one of the conditions, and that's the parking condition, just to tighten it up in terms of the vehicle parking within the site for the uh, future occupiers of the flats and the commercial uses, so that's just adding those extra red word in there, uh, some amendments there, so that uh, tightens that up from a, a planning uh, enforcement perspective. Um, so that's the only change in terms of the conditions, but I'll leave you with a summary and the recommendation is to approve, Chairman. Okay, thank you very much, Chris, for that uh, detailed report. Um, I won't start, I'll open it up to others if you want to start asking questions. Councillor Lydiard. Do you have any electric charging points in the car park? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I don't think there's any proposals for electric car charging units on this particular occasion, and we haven't actually requested any at this time. Uh, any other questions? <coughs> No, okay. So um, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions, Chris. Now, you, you probably know from me being on planning for quite some time now, parking and, and, and a reduction of uh, parking is always something that, 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 that I am against. It's not something I'm in favour for. Um, looking through the whole report, there, there are a few concerns that I have. Um, it's quite a long-winded question. Um, <clears throat> so first off, we, we know that local businesses and, and the high street struggling. Um, if we're going to have a reduction of uh, public parking spaces, then I do worry about how much of a more of an impact that's going to have on uh, the local businesses. I don't think if you're going to build uh, a block of flats and reduce the number of public car parking spaces, in my opinion, I don't think that offsets the footfall on, on loss of, of, of shoppers. In terms of the reduction in car parking spaces, uh, 76 down to 43, um, there's also an argument here that, well, actually, by reducing it, you're, you're going to put off the commuters that, that use the um, uh, train station. But I've, I've never really believed that argument. Uh, one of the reasons I don't believe in that commuter argument is because Lakeside are very susceptible to shoppers uh, parking in the multi-storey and using Chafford 100. And I, the reason I believe Lakeside are not too worried about that is because I, I believe that they perceive that actually those commuters do shop and um, the commuters that are using that car park will walk through the, the high street and use the shops. So that, that's a concern I have. Um, in relation to um, reducing access to the shopping centre, does that not go against our policy? Is CSTPA on page 106.63? Um, does that not go against that policy? Um, I'll probably end the question there. Uh, if you could have a quick look at that on page 106.63. Cheers. So, yeah, policy seeks to maintain and promote the retail function of existing centres. But obviously, if you're going to reduce the public car parking, I would argue it goes against that. Uh, could you comment on that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I understand your point. Um, the policy, um, in terms of looking at that, maintain there isn't any retail um, use on this site at, at present. But in terms of promoting, the two commercial units would add two additional units within the town centre to provide additional commercial usage. Could be for retail, could be for other uses. Um, so, would in, so in my view, that would um, lead to pro promote the retail function of the existing centre, and therefore could improve the vitality and viability of that centre in terms of those additional un units um, filling in the, this, this street block and linking clearly with the High Street and King Street where at present there is that gap so it would help in from a street scene perspective link those commercial units and those two roads within this town centre. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and in relation to the residential units, again, I, I will raise it every month. I'll continue to do it. I've, I'm not happy with our draft parking standards, although we are um, we are sort of uh, our hands are tied in terms of, of rejecting applications on those bases. What stops? Because I'm not happy with the amount of spaces for the uh, apartment block, albeit it is policy compliant. What stops resident people visiting the residents using the public car park? I assume nothing stops it. It's just the way it is. What worries me about that is if somebody comes to visit, they're going to take, they're going to visit a resident, and they're not going to shop. Um, that's going to cause a bit of a concern, isn't it? An additional concern to the high street. Thank you. There are um, free visitor spaces shown within the um, application site itself, but the, the public car park um, is outside of the site, so people who are visiting the um, people perhaps in the flats uh, may use the public car parks or, or roads within the area wherever they could uh, decide to decide to park. Um, they could have also the added benefit that if they're visiting people, they could then start uh, do dual use and go shopping as well within the town centre and. Um, could lead to more people coming into the town centre if they're visiting people within those flats. Okay, thank you. I've asked enough questions there. Um, we'll go to Steve Taylor. Chris, from what you said there, you're, it, it's, it's, which is how I read it, it's increasing the number of shops whilst reducing the ability for people to park in the town centre to use those shops. So I think the, the point that the um, chairman brought up about um, the number of car parking spaces is always an issue, but if ever you go to that car park, I don't know if you ever have, I, I use it fairly frequently, and it's always busy. I'm not saying it's always packed, but it's not far short. So all those little shops, like the dry cleaners and the butchers and all the places that I would normally go, all of a sudden become somewhat useless from my point of view, because unless you drive in circles for about an hour... Then and you wait for someone to pull out, and hopefully you get into that space along the street. So, so although I know you said about um, was it 6.3, it promotes it. I, I'm kind of would question that, since you promote the shopping centre but reduce the people's ability to use it. I understand your point. Um, Obviously, it is a town centre location, so there are a, a, a range of means of transport modes to access the town centre. Some people may use their cars, not everyone can. Or some people may walk, they may cycle. There's access to the nearby train station and bus services in the area. And the MPPF and our own local uh, plan core strategy does, it, does encourage um, uh, opportunities for residential use within town centres, whether it be at upper, upper levels, um, which can create um, that vitality and that viability, uh, which is, uh, you know, comes from the MPPF in terms of um, uh, national policy guidance, uh, and making best use of our town centres rather than just being commercial uses. So giving that vitality and that evening use that perhaps it may not have at present by having more, uh, uh, more people within the town centre in there. Um, that's, that's that. Thanks, Chris. I guess we, we just view that somewhat differently. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further questions at the moment? No? Okay, so we do have uh, three speakers on this item this evening. So first off is a, a statement of objection, and that's uh, Councillor Shane Hebb, and you're the Ward Councillor. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I, Terry, many residents many of the small business and businesses of King Street and High Street believe this application is a contravention of at least six material planning considerations. My own objection to the sale of this land and the application of 2012 is well documented. I'm not going to seek to rehash that. Tonight needs to be about the material considerations of the scheme in front of us. Thorough Council's policy chair, I completely agree with you, CSTP8, is to maintain and promote the retail function of the existing centres. This application will not maintain it. It will destroy the current retail offer of King Street and High Street. This land was sold, Chair, on the premise that there would be 100 parking spaces with three hours of short-term use for free. For reference, the item 15 of the Cabinet Agenda, which was published and discussed on the 10th of April 2013. My emphasis is on two things, 100 free spaces and free 100 spaces. And the complexity of what's in front of us tonight isn't just about the fact that, you know, it's lovely seeing 96 brandished up there. But the reality is, Chair, 
we are going to have a development which has 47 new properties with respects. There's no saying that each property will only have one car per abode. We live in the real world, not the world that the council wants us to live in. There are going to be very likely to be two cars in each property, which, guess what, takes away nearly 60% of the car parking spaces that are available in that space that was on that map in front of us. I'd like someone to explain to me and local businesses that how ripping up conditions of the land registry documents and taking away so many spaces will maintain short-stop retail purchases. Butchers, bakers, dry cleaners, the points have already been ably made. When one mile away, only one mile away, there is a shopping centre away with 300 free car parking spaces. For what? Two retail units, 47 flats. A reduction of net 60% provided that each property has two cars on it and not a single promise of the free car parking that this land was sold with a condition on. The land was sold for a mere 350000 If you look over the road at number 1 to 2 South End Road, there are flats of a similar design selling for £240,000. If you do the math at this site, that will mean that the receipts, if, you know, for the sale of 47 properties, if half of that cost went to developing the scheme, you would be earning a profit of about £5.7 million for £350,000 that it was sold. Is the value or is the loss of our small businesses worth that? It's, this application is shameless in its attempts to develop in the guises of so-called regeneration. Losing our independent retailers is not a price worth paying for an application that takes all and gives nearly nothing back. The second condition, or the second material consideration, Chair, is that the design layout and impact of the area. At multiple storeys high, five storeys, this will shadow the town, whilst the rest are two to three storeys high. They are ground floor shop retail units with maisonette properties above them. This is a home county's town. It isn't New York. This is out of character and it's out of order. I take issue with the point in section 6.14. Yes, the 2012 application was passed, but let's not forget that was despite protestations from local ward councillors or some of the ward councillors, from many residents, from many small businesses. It doesn't make it right to pass this application because it isn't the same. Stanford I Hope is owed a debt by the council's asset department and planning department, and I will contradict them here. There is no precedent that has been set back in 2012. There is an abrupt change for the loss of amenity. The 2012 application has gone from 22 properties and 100 spaces to this application going to 47 properties with a significant loss of car parking, accounting for two car parking spaces. This is not the same application at all. There is no precedent. The okay, first uh, sorry, condition... Obviously, I know you've got quite a bit more to go through. We've run in short time, so if you could speed it up. Thank you. Yes, certainly. Um, I've little, well, I have a number of things to add quite clearly. Um, I've talked about the 100 spaces, the traffic access and car parking. I believe that is a failed obligation under the conditions. Um, section 6.25 talks about a minimal impact. Um, it's already a nightmare parking around King Street. That's been well documented. Impact upon heritage assets and effects on neighbouring properties, five storeys, the picture or, or the description that you can still see the church from the town and retain the town's identity w was quite embellishing and then you suddenly saw the reality. Suddenly you have to peek through two buildings to see it. Mr um, Chair, um, or clearly I, I oppose this development in the strongest terms. SS17 deserves so much more. There are genuine considerations that are material. It's flawed logic. I've already gone into it. I'll close there. Mr Chair, thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Councillor. <clears throat> okay, so uh, next I'd like to invite down um, a statement of support. That's uh, Mr Simmons, and uh, I understand you're the agent. Uh, if you'd like to come down and uh, present your application. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Danny Simmons. I'm from RPS, and I'm a planning consultant and the agent for the applicant. Uh, the principle of a mixed-use residential development is acceptable on the application site for the following reasons. The site is a brownfield site in an accessible and sustainable town centre location. The site has been allocated for development for a number of years and notably your core strategy includes the site within the defined town centre 
of Stanford Le Hope, where both retail and residential are considered acceptable. And the site has been the subject of a relatively recent permission granted by the Borough Council in December 2012 for a previous mixed-use scheme. The current scheme has the effect of making the most efficient use of a brownfield site, but at the same time respecting the character of the area. A benefit of the proposals is the increase in the number of residential units, providing for 47 units, importantly including 35% affordable housing provision, but at the same time including retail and commercial floor space at ground floor level, which we believe will enhance the vitality and viability of the town centre. The provision of residential units on a brownfield site will of course assist the council in meeting their challenging housing requirements and for example will assist in reducing the need to release Greenbelt and other greenfield sites. Notwithstanding the benefits of maximising use of the site, careful consideration has been given to the issue of design. Whilst the building will range between three, four and five storeys, the scheme has been reduced in height compared to the previous scheme, as was shown on the screen. Um, and importantly, the scheme does retain views of the listed church from both King Street and also from other vantage points outside of the town centre. It should be noted that the Urban Design Officer has no objection to the proposals and that the Council Officers have concluded, as set out in the report, that the proposed development achieves the local plan requirement of high quality design and can be successfully integrated into the town centre. The scheme has the benefit of retaining and safeguarding much of the car park for public use. Indeed, the information based on current usage and demand shows that the retained car park will adequately accommodate demand for short-stay town centre carping, car parking. <clears throat> and can you note, and I've heard the comments about car parking, but can you note that the car parking provision is considered acceptable by the council's highways officer and indeed your highways officer has no objection to the proposals on transport or car parking grounds. Okay, thank you. If you can just uh, yep, sorry. Up, just last bit. Thank um, you. In addition, the applicants have produced technical reports covering the issues of sunlight, daylight, transport, heritage and trees, all of which confirm the acceptability of the proposals. And finally, accordingly, in land use terms, planning policy and site specific issues, it's respectfully considered that the proposals are acceptable. Uh, so thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, and we have one more speaker this evening. That's uh, uh, Councillor Terry Piccolo, although you will be speaking uh, as a resident. Uh, so please come down. You've got a three minutes in which to present your application. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I would like to start by cons by correcting an error in the report, which has already been mentioned, is that there are actual factor 100 par public car, 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 car parking spaces at the present rather than 76. At 6.4 of the report refers to provision previous applications to support, to support this. However, I would argue that a reduction of around 60% in the parking with no guarantee of free parking would not enhance the viability of the town centre, but decimate it. At 614 of the report, again states that previous permissions should be used as a benchmark to, act, to assess its application, thus bringing the need for 100 free car parking spaces into play. It must be remembered that Corringham is less than two minutes away and has over 350 free parking spaces. If people can't park in Stanford, they will just drive to Corringham 
the Stanford business will suffer. At 6.25, the report refers to the transport assessment. It is unlikely that this was conducted at a peak period. I use the car park on a regular basis, and at times there are no spaces available. This would mean at least 200 movements a day, and that would be if parked cars stayed all day. The figures, in my view, are unrealistic and should be given very little weight in regard to the actual state usage. And just as an aside, the, the photos that were shown of the car park showed more than the, the limited number of cars that's been referred to. Talks about a good supply of parking in Stamford and High Street. I would argue that 82, which is roughly how many spaces there would be in High Street, is hardly a good supply for the second largest town shopping centre outside of Grace. Talks about new, 6.49 talks about new residents' households spending in the local shops. Allowing for one shop per household, that would equate to 47 additional customers. A reduction of 68 parking spaces, even if they were only used twice a day, is a potential loss of 126 customers. Whilst the town centre will, highly, will be highly accessible to the limited number of people that live in the development, it will become much less accessible for the other 5,000 plus residents. Recommendation 8 states vehicle parking areas to be used by those related to the development with no mention of the public car park. One of the reasons given is to avoid residents parking in adjoining streets. Where do you think the displaced shoppers' cars from the small car park will go? I now move on to the original sale of the land and the land registry document. Uh, 11.14 states that guarantees of the provision of not less than 100 car parking spaces in the car park to be made available free of charge for a minimum of three hours. And at 12.3, shall permanently maintain and keep open the car park unless otherwise uh, agreed by deed of variation. As the applicant and officers have frequently referred to the previous permission in support of this application, I wish to do the same. It was quite clearly the intention of the council to maintain a free public car park service in 100 cars as part of the South and previous permission. I would, I would argue that this intention formed a major part of the discounted sale price and should be adhered to. I also understand that unless an application has been made for a deed of variation to the land registry, the provision of 100 car parking spaces should be included in any permission granted. And just an extract from the approved cabinet minutes of, of the 10th of the 4th, 2013, Part of it says for the, agree, for the negotiated sum of £350,000 on conditions that the site continues to provide the same number of free parking spaces and the reason for that was the scheme which has received planning consent maintains the same number of shoppers parking spaces as is currently provided by the council's land ownership. It is to be a condition of the sale that these are maintained as free to shoppers as it is currently the case. Just... In case the planning office doesn't have it, I do actually have with me a copy of the land registry document and also a copy of the minutes from the asset management delivery plan that I referred to at 2013. So if it, would, if it helps the officer um, in answering any questions the members may have, I'm quite happy to give them a copy. And just finally, I understand that a petition was handed in of some 500 signatures. I don't know whether or not that has been mentioned. Okay, all right, we'll clarify that. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Piccolo. Okay, so uh, we'll on to further questions. Right, so there was a few questions there. Um, Councillor Rice, did you want to come in? Uh, questions? Uh, yes, Chair. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we're told that um, obviously some of the uh, existing public car park will be taken away. Um, I mean, obviously, what could happen here. Um, is if this scheme was to have croft car parking and then go up another story, then you'd ha actually have car parking underneath the actual exists well the ac the actual new flats. Uh, that could be a way of remedying uh, this situation. But however, that's a matter of, obviously with the applicant whether they w wish to take that up. But there is. There is something that could be done um, and still maintain that as a public car park. And obviously, um, I'd be interested whether that could be achieved, you know. Um, 
for you, Chair. The um, ground floor level, as shown on the plan there, does include an area for uh, car parking. And I'll come back to the layout plan. Just makes that a bit more clearer. Uh, so, with the, underneath the building, there would be this area of parking shown. So there is, un there is undercroft parking for the development um, in addition to the outside space over towards the western side of the car park. OK, Steve Taylor. I think, Chris, that what, unless I've misunderstood what Councillor Rice was saying, what he was talking about was public parking, not parking for the development. So he was suggesting a lower level. That was my interpretation of what was said. Well, the parking as shown is, is for the development. It's not for the public car park. Um, you'd have to go down another level in terms of excavation, if that's what you're indicating, as a two-level tier of... And, and I believe that's exactly what, okay. Councillor, uh, right. what Councillor Rice was suggesting as, a, as an option. Right. It's not before us in terms of the planning application. It is what's, what's shown on the plan, so we don't have that to show that whether that's possible or not. Thanks, Chris. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a few questions, Chris. It, basically, I'll just I'll just follow up on, on a couple of uh, councillor, oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Pickard's points. Um, <clears throat> first of all, a petition. Have we, I've, I'm looking at the. I can see obviously there's uh, complaints, but have we got a petition there? Or? We have some objections, but I've not seen a 500 word petition. I don't know when that was submitted. To 500 the signature office. petition. Oh, sorry, 500 signature. Okay. All right. Well, that's uh, that is what it is. Let me just uh, write that down. Um, in terms of uh, a lot of the points that. that uh, Mr. Pickeye raised. So the, the car park was sold on the proviso, so 350 it, it was incredibly cheap, but it was um, sold on the proviso that it uh, maintained the same number of spaces. So how can, how, can that, how can that come to be? I mean, is, is the original agreement no longer valid? Was it only valid for a certain time? Um, yeah, could you answer that for us, please? Thank you. The land registry documents are completely separate to the uh, planning any planning permission or any planning permission on the site. Um, I have looked at those those documents and um, the documents that uh, Mr Piccolo was, was mentioning there um, related to the sale of the site in regard to the 2012 planning permission. So if that development had, had taken place, then those conditions would bite. But that permission has now lapsed and cannot now be implemented. So um, following some legal advice I received earlier today that um, those conditions would now no longer be in place in regard to um, uh, the future development of this site. Okay, that's interesting. So you, we sell the land at 350,000. We, we pose these conditions. That's based on a 2012 application. Now that didn't go ahead, did it? Obviously, but then by that not going ahead, it then it then took away the right of the 100 spaces. Is that correct? Yeah, the conditions are um, regarding the land registry documentation, so separate, they're not planning conditions, they're a completely separate piece of legislation, so they're not tied into uh, the uh, planning permission, they're tied into a land registry, so it was part of the sales uh, of, that, of that land. I mean, I'm not an expert on land registry, I'm, so uh, my, uh, we've got a sister with us, if, if needs be, to can, um, go into more detail on that. Um, so, um, as I was saying, that they are part of the land registry and they're not planning per planning conditions. Okay, so um, it really looks like there. It's, it's not really not worth the papers written on, is it? In terms of planning, I mean, you can turn, you can sell a piece of land and say you must have 103 spaces, but it comes to the committee and it's not relevant. That's basically where we are with that. Basically, that appears to be the position, unless that application came in again for the same thing and met the requirements of those conditions in terms of uh, what it says. But uh, that is not the application before us. It's a different application that's before us. So, uh, yes, you're right in your, your view there. OK. Um, so any other questions whilst I'm Steve Taylor, then Councillor Hamilton. So, so, so what you're saying, Chris, is that a condition, and this is very confusing for me, I'm sorry, but if it's nothing to do with planning, who legally is in a position to enforce the original agreement? Yeah, if it's not the planning committee, who would it be? 
I don't know if the chair, if the legal can advise on this. Chair, if I can assist. Um, the land was transferred by the council for three hundred fifty thousand pounds in 2013. <clears throat> Unfortunately, all the restrictions that these are restrictive covenants were were imposed for the 2012 permission. So everything that was on the 2012 permission. The, the restrictive covenants within the transfer refer to that being carried out. So all those restrictions require that to be implemented and carried out and as a consequence of that then you'd have the restrictions for the 100 car parking spaces. Because, those, um, because that was never implemented, um, that simply cannot be enforced. It's, it's simply fallen away. And the party that would have enforced it would have been the council as landowner, not the planning committee. But it has now simply lapsed, I'm afraid. There is nothing there to buy on. So, so let, me, let me just summarise what I think you've just said. If I put in a planning application for, say, 50 houses on a site, and there are various conditions applied, like I have to maintain an X number of car parking spaces, you grant the, the, the planning committee grant the permission. If I then choose to not build it and then come back again two years later or three years later and want to build something twice as big, which is what we see very, very, very regularly, those conditions are history. It depends on how the, how the covenants are phrased. In this case, they're directly related to the 2012 permission. The other way of, norm, of de dealing with it is to put covenants relating to the use of the land forever and a day. But that wasn't done in this case, and I don't know why not. But it was just binding the 2012 scheme. Okay, I get that now. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton. Well, to be honest, have we uncovered a, a fatal flaw or a, something that's gone wrong that for the first time has been recognised the fact that were, for example, as my predecessor has just mentioned, you could load up a lot of uh, conditions, covenants, restrictions on a particular... Um, to, to allow the sale, possibly allow that um, planning commission to lapse, either deliberately or not deliberately, but let it to lapse, and then say, right, all those conditions, all those restrictions, are no longer valid. You've sold the land for you mentioned 300,000, 300, over 300,000, which is, as you can appreciate, is minuscule. It, it's nothing. You've got all those restrictions and suddenly they no longer apply. You've got the land at a, a minimal cost. Come back a little bit later and as has quite exactly been pointed out, a larger development with no um, requirement to honour those particular conditions. And I think, is it now that this is a particular flaw or is it something that is... Uh, something that's only now been discovered or something that has been recognised but not uh, not um, particularly acknowledged because I think a lot of people now will, will say well hold on a minute I've got restrictions on these particular things if I let it lapse do it comes back and find out that uh, they no longer apply I've got some land I can do what I like with it and I think that's uh, atrocious I think what has just been said from legal, that if those weren't put on the actual planning commission, or, or, or should be, or were on the actual planning commission, but not necessarily on the land, then I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed that you can sit there and say now those conditions no longer apply. We can now go ahead with a, requesting approval for this, and planning is only, a, a, I think, a, a significant point, but there's also other considerations which are... Um, Mentioned, I mean, the list on 19, page 99 and 100, loss of meaning, out of character, scale, um, everything else, um, that is apart, apart, apart from the back, the, the parking. But I just think, coming back to what you've said, I think that definitely needs an inquiry. I definitely think that needs something more than this, this committee to consider. Thank you. Chair, if, if I may, uh, the monitoring officer has in fact done a report on this in uh, May 2017. So it's already been acknowledged that the covenants no longer can be enforced. So it's been known for some time. 
is there acknowledgement that, that the initial granting of the planning application was flawed in the sense that they can now longer be enforced? No, the, the original grant of planning permission was fine. That was in 2012. The problem has been in the, in the wording used in the transfer documents. The, so the restrictive covenants imposed should have been better. For some reason, they were required to be related to the 2012 permission and that scheme. They didn't go further and restrict the land itself. Is it something that now, with hindsight, we would have changed? Or is it something now that we now realise this problem and will now take other actions? I don't know why it happened the way it did uh, in 2013, but I think looking at it since, I think all of us agreed that we would prefer to put direct covenants on the land that restrict its use in the future and not to directly relate it to a planning scheme because that could always change. So, yes, it wasn't. As it has done. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Rice, did you want to come in there? Question? Well, all I was going to say, Chair, is the only way you could have controlled this is if you'd had a, a legal agreement alongside the sale indicating that... Um, for instance, if there was a certain amount of building going on to this particular site, then the council would get an uplift on that. So the council would get an extra receipt. That's the only way the council could have gained more money. But, of course, we are dependent on our legal experts at the time. Uh, they give us the advice when we're selling land. Uh, perhaps this is something we have to look at in, you know, when we sell more land. Because... Uh, it sounds to me it's very important that we get this right because uh, we're not getting best value for our land. Okay. Um, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. In uh, reference to Councillor Rice, I have recently inquired on the matter of a few constituents of mine, the purchase of land. Uh, one land has owned one piece of land and speaking from personal experience, has only got permission to be used as a garden and on no way will have planning permission and that land will go for a minimum amount. But on the proviso that in future, if planning permission was to be uh, offered on this land 10, 20, 30 years time, then they would, the planning permission would have to go through or the purchase would then recognise the fact that it had gone through the planning permission. Uh, and be subsequently a lot more money. And I think the situation in this case is, I, I'm, I'm just amazed that I should come uh, today and hear what has happened, and I think it's a flaw in the legal side. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, any further questions? <coughs> no, okay. Um, I'm just going to grab some advice from Andy. Uh, it's actually in relation to the uh, petition that's not been handed in. Please hold for a second.
apologies, members, just a couple more moments. Okay, thank you. Um, first and foremost, I've noticed it's 9.30. Uh, I'd like to suspend standing orders to the end of uh, close of business. So are we happy with that? So only one more item after this one. Fantastic, thank you. Um, okay, so we'll now move over to debate. Now, um, I've, I've sought some advice from Andy. We was a little bit worried about this 500 signature petition that um, supposedly has arrived with the council on Tuesday that has not been brought to our attention. Um, the advice I've been given is that we should really be made aware of that. We need to look at it. We need to be uh, given advice from officers. Unfortunately, that, that would mean um, a deferral, uh, so we could have that in front of us. And if we are going to defer it, I wanted, on that basis, if you agree, I wanted to see what the opinion was on the site visit. Now, I don't know whether that's, that's something that you want to do, but um, as we didn't enter the debate stage, I wasn't sure what, if you were in favour, whether you was worried about the, the building itself. Um, so does anyone have any suggestions? I would like to recommend a deferral on the basis of the 500 signature. I do apologise on that. Uh, Councillor Rice? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to... Uh support the deferral. Um, if, if we want a site visit, obviously we can go along there and look there. I mean, I know the area very well, um, but it doesn't negate us having a site visit. So, you know, if that's uh, the wishes, I'd propose that. Um, and if you want to second it, then we can put it to the vote and then people can decide whether they wish to have a site visit. Councillor Hamilton? I'm no objection to deferral, a site visit I'm no objection to. I don't think that's going to um, change things, to be honest. I'm all for it, if that's what you want to do. But I don't think it's going to change the, the crux of the matter, the problems. But I accept it. Okay. All right. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, I'm, I'm actually similar to, to Councillor Rice. I mean, if we are going to defer it, I mean, I, I don't necessarily, I do know the area very well, but um, we do need to see this uh, petition on, on, on the basis of that advice, because obviously we've got objections, but we've got nowhere near the, the, the amount that, that, that's proposed there. So I would like to recommend yeah. Councillor Rice. Perhaps that petition, when we do find it, could be emailed to every member so that we can actually understand it uh, and the objections that are in there. Yeah, OK. Point of order, Chairman. I mean, with respect, surely it's not beyond the realms of possibility for someone to go and walk upstairs to pick up the petition and bring it here now? Um, Andy, did you want to come in on that? Or? Uh, the, the problem is, Chair, whilst I appreciate Councillor Hebb's comments, I've, I've, the first I've heard of that petition was this evening. The case officer doesn't know anything about it. The team leader doesn't know anything about it. So where it is in a building, I don't know, firstly. Uh, and secondly... I, with, with, with due respect to the, the people who put that petition in, I'd like to think that we could give it some consideration and advise members of the content of it as well. So uh, the, the absence of any knowledge of it causes me some concern. Yeah, I agree with uh, Andy there. Look, this, unfortunately, this, this is planning sometimes. If, if we're going to have, have, have petitions and, and they're not in front of us, it does, it does cause potential problems. It is, it is unfortunate that there's a delay there, but unfortunately um, it's important that we, we do take our time and get this right. Um, so I'd like to propose a deferral to get that petition in our possession. Uh, Councillor Hamilton, did you want to come in on that? I'm going to say that time moves on. We've got one more uh, item to consider, so a deferral, I think, is the best compromise. Okay, so all those in favour of a deferral so we can get the petition uh, in our possession or, uh, solely for that, please raise your hands. And okay. if that petition can be emailed to the members with obviously the officer advice on that petition yeah. so that okay. we're time we come to the next meeting we're in full knowledge of the facts. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Okay. All right then. So um obviously I apologise for the delay there. Application reference eighteen stroke zero zero five four zero stroke F U L has been deferred for a later date on the basis of the possession of the petition. Uh thank you very much. We'll now move on to the last item on the agenda, which is whoop, which is the civic amenity site uh, that's uh, found uh, 
on page 127, uh, it's agenda item 13, that's 18 stroke 015 stroke 08 stroke TBC. Thank you. And uh, John, would you like to present a report? Thank you, Chair. This application proposes the extension and redevelopment of the existing civic amenity site in Buckingham Hill Road. The proposals include the extension of the public site northwards onto land presently used for skip storage, a new site access to the northern end of the site, a new two-storey building towards the middle of the site to be used as offices, meeting room, store and welfare facilities, reprofiling of the western side of the site to allow improved access to the storage containers, the provision of a ghost island right turn lane into the site and other ancillary works within the site to reorganise it. A wheel washing facility is also to be provided. So the um, plan on the screen at the moment is the red line site area, so it encompasses part of the highway where the ghost island will be. We've got this section here, which is the existing site open to members of the public. And we've got this section, which is part of the land which is currently used for skip storage and not publicly accessible. So this is an existing view looking north from the existing northern access. That's looking south from the existing northern access. So at this point, HGVs enter the site at the north, and this is the exit for um, public using the site. <coughs> That's looking southwest within the site, so this is the exit from the site and where the HGVs come in and go out. And you can see the, the profile of the land there where there's a higher bank to the western part of the site. That's looking north. This is the area of land that's used for skip storage and not available to the members of the public because the environmental permit basically stops where the cursor is so there's no, no waste can be taken there. This can only be used for skip storage. That's looking within the site, so this is other areas where the skips are stored. That's the banking to the west of the site, which does have some screening impacts in blocking views from the west. Again, that's looking west across the site, so you can see the land levels again, sort of approximately two to two and a half metres higher to the west. That's looking south. Again, you've got the banking. That's looking from inside the main public area of the site with some of the bins, the recycling facilities. That's looking southeast, so that's the entrance to the site around the side fencing. At the moment the vehicles come, public vehicles come through the site from south to north. That's the existing entrance to the site for the public. Um, so the, this is the new site plan that so shows the ghost right turn lane along there. So there will be a middle lane of traffic where people can stop and wait to enter the site. The new site entrance to the north and the new improved entrance to the south. This area in blue is to be an attenuation pond for um, surface water drainage. So this is the new Im improved site. So this is presently the area that's not open to the public. So there will be a new access for all vehicles to the north. Vehicles, uh, public vehicles will come in, drive around the site. There's an, a single lane on the inside where people can then back into the spaces and there's a running lane around the outside so there's no conflict with vehicles parking and stopping. This grey area here is where the land is going to be raised, so vehicles drive up the ramp here. This is, the, again, the parking and uh, manoeuvring lanes, so vehicles back into these spaces. People get out of their cars and drop stuff into the bins, which are a lower level. And again, there's a second lane so that vehicles can move around the manoeuvring vehicles. Again, on this part, there's spaces where people can back in and then drop the stuff into the top of the containers so you don't have to walk up steps. So this area is basically raised, this is ground level, and the rest of the site is sort of ground level through the site. The HGVs will all access and come along here. There's an HGV turning area for collecting the bins. There's also a wheel wash facility and a way bridge. So the HGVs will all access from the north and head out through the south. So there'll be no conflict where the present HGVs come in and out through there. There is conflict with vehicles from members of the public. Um, that's the recycling area, and this area in the middle is the office and welfare facilities. This is a cross section through the site, so we're on this one. We're looking. This is the west of the site, and that's Buckingham Hill Road. So it shows the changes in levels. So that the buildings will be somewhat disguised by the changes in levels across the site. This is the main building in the centre of the site. So there's going to be an office at first floor level, ground floor. There's going to be a store area which can be used for storing items that are too good to recycle. They can be given to charities who can then reuse them. And then there's the welfare facilities that ground floor already. This is an uh, elevations of the building from the front and back. 
So the application site is in the green belt, and again, like the previous application of mine, it's not for one of the forms of development considered acceptable in terms of the MPPF or the core strategy. So it does represent inappropriate development, which is objectionable in principle. Um, the applicant has put forward a number of matters which they consider to be the very special circumstances, and these are outlined at pages 136 and 142. Um, on balance, it's considered the matters put forward would clearly outweigh the harm to the green belt. It's considered, therefore, that the proposal would be acceptable in terms of the impact on the green belt. In terms of other matters, the main building on the site would be acceptable in design and scale, given its use, and the other ancillary buildings on the site have been sited and designed to reduce their impact on the wider area. The proposed ghost island would reduce queues affecting vehicles travelling south on Buckingham Hill Road, so it would have wider highways benefits, not just to users of the site, and the highways officer raises no objections to the proposals. Other matters of detail are also considered to be acceptable. So approval is recommended, subject to conditions, and again, the application being referred to the Secretary of State as a departure from Greenbelt policy. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any further questions? Uh, Steve Taylor. Sorry, I don't seem to stop tonight. So I'll take the Greenbelt hat off because the site's already there and it's, it makes sense to carry on using it. But that looks to me like it used to operate, similar to the way it used to operate. And so it gets rid of the staircases that currently people have to wobble up and down and trip over and thank God for that. In that case, end of story. Councillor Hampton, sorry. Thank you. Um, the exit for the cars, does it share the same exit gate as the lorries? It's not quite clear on this map. Can you yeah, confirm it? Present Sorry, of the, the proposal, all vehicles will come in through the north. The public vehicles, so the members of the public depositing their rubbish, will come along this part and access the western part of the site. The HGVs will come in and will access this area, which is separate from the public. They've got a turnaround area if they need to collect the, the bins, and they will access by the same, same access as the members of the public. At present... So at present, this is the northern access to the site. HGVs come in and go out through there, but the public vehicles come out. So there is conflict when the HGVs are sort of turning into the site and the public are trying to get out. Under the new, under the new proposals, everyone goes in at the top, goes round, and then comes out at the bottom. So there's no conflict. Um, yes, I can understand where there's a diversion where the public cars continue around, the, if you like, the rear or the back of the site and the, uh, the lorries around the front, for want of a better term. It's just that the fact that they're going to merge when they emerge. When they come onto the road, you're going to have a, a conflict between the lorries and the car. Um, it, very good design as far as I can see at the moment, especially when you mention about the, the stairs. I mean, I've been up those stairs and fortunately I don't... I don't wear stilettos, but I imagine they were metal stairs which were hazardous at the best of times. Shh, shh, only at weekends. Um, but seriously, it, it, it's a definite improvement. Um, I'm just concerned about sharing the exit because if you're in a big lorry and you're in a car, there's perhaps a little bit of bullying there. Uh, I've got other things that I can mention if you want me to um, later on, but... At the, at the moment... Through the northern access, the HGVs are coming and going in the same access as the cars are coming in. So the cars could be coming in, but the HGV could be going out. With this instance, you they, everyone comes in at the top and goes at the bottom. So the HGVs will be accessing on Buckingham Hill Road as they would before, but they won't be meeting the cars coming out of the site. They'll only be turning onto a road like an HGV would turn onto a normal road anyway. So there's no, no conflict at the access between vehicles coming and going to the site. The exit... At the exit, they'll all be going the same way. So HGVs exiting the site at the north will conflict with vehicles. So however however an HGV gets onto the, the main road, there will be some conflict with vehicles. But in this one, everybody comes goes through the site, so everybody comes out the same way. So there's no conflict from HGVs going out with vehicles actually accessing the site itself. But there'll be a conflict with emerging of cars and lorries. No, they'd, they'd be directed. The, the HGVs wouldn't 
would be stopped if a car was coming along the access road. Sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. That's what that's what I want to say. So internal. they won't, won't be vying for uh, no, no. for that one exit. There will be internal um, internal site management. Which Thank you. That's what I was hoping. Okay, thank you, Councillor Sammons. So I take it there's going to be a separate line for queuing to go in because as the ward councillor for that area, it has been for the last 30 odd years a major problem, especially the weekend if you're coming from Stanford back in Swiss Tilbury, that you're stuck behind a queue of traffic that just want to go to the tip. And it can be quite dangerous if you think, oh, well, I don't want the tip, and you try to get past those vehicles because the road's quite narrow and you're going to be sort of coming head on to the traffic going out. Yep, the plan on the screen shows the new ghost right turn lane, so vehicles coming into the site access can effectively queue in the middle of Buckingham Hill Road and you can have a row of traffic still flowing south along there, yeah. So you're sort of making the road wider? Because that's not a particularly big road, is it? And obviously we've got the traffic light system at the moment. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I believe it's being um, localised widening around the entrance to create the slip road into the uh, site to allow for the right turn lane so that vehicles can pass without the difficulties. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll go on to uh, the speaker statement and then we'll come back to further questions. Uh, Councillor uh, Aaron Watkins, uh, would you like to uh, present your statement? Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you, members. Um, I do fully support the extension and the redevelopment of the civic community site at Linford. Um, the Environment Service, um, as has been well documented, has continues to be ambitious and continues to be ambitious of what it wants to deliver for residents. And this is right up there in one of those ambitions to improve the service used by not just my own board in particular, but every single resident within Forrock. And this multi-million pound project will go some way into doing that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there are several reasons why the extension and the redevelopment of the site will help improve the service. Forrock residents um, uh, receive, um, residents, sorry, receive. Um, currently the site is lacking needed investment and capacity, which is from several existing constraints which are present on the site, which are well documented within this. The redevelopment will help firstly through expansion take on more demand, something which benefits everyone. The site currently is designed to accept 6,000 tonnes of household waste and is currently taking on substantially more. The redevelopment and the expansion within that will help support the existing demand along with future demand. The provision of the right turn ghost lane, which has already been mentioned, which is being proposed as part of the redevelopment of the site, will not only improve the access for users entering the site, but also improve the access for anyone wanting to go on to Tilbury and into Linford, also down that way. And we all know the importance of recycling and providing better recycling facilities for residents. The current civic community site does not allow for expansion and growth, both in the waste it can take, but also the different types of different styles of waste in which it can take. I'm glad to see that as part of the plans, so there will also be an emphasis on allowing further recycling opportunities, and this does come in multiple formats. Um, one of those has already been mentioned, which is the reuse. This is actually something the government, um, under the new plans uh, for the environmental waste strategies they've announced, um, is part of that. They're kind of wanting councils to do more with reuse, and that's something which is very much going to be a part of this, and allowing us to work with charities to provide so materials and equipment, etc., can be reused. And additionally, as already been mentioned as well, through the ramp, it will be more accessible for all residents in Fark, which again, as already been mentioned with the stairs as it currently is, takes that away so that residents can go up on the ramp and just drop litter straight in, which is good news for them. Um, Chairman and members, I hope uh, this gets your full support. I'm not going to take too much of your time like I know I can do normally. Um, I believe this is a very positive step in the right direction. It continues to, with what the department is always wanting to go for. This redevelopment will be fantastic for residents all across Farrock, and I really um, look forward to hopefully seeing something from it. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that uh, statement there. Um, any further questions? Councillor Hamilton? Sorry. Uh, I'm actually amazed when I read on page 129 about the lack of facility. You've got an electric generator currently being used, no um, no service, uh, water drain, I mean, no drainage system officially. And I'm just amazed that all these years it's this anchaic. 
I'm sure it's got running water, but I, I just I, I can't believe it. it's got this far. And therefore, yes, I would definitely approve this. Um, I think this is a step up, not only because in future we will need a greater capacity site, but the fact that uh, you're really updating and redesigning the whole site is, I think, is to be commendable. Um, I can't say anything more than that. The only thing is, with the mains electricity, will it be open longer hours? Yeah, the hours is condition uh, condition 18. So, yeah, the mains lighting will allow, or mains electricity will allow flood lighting, so it will be open longer hours. Um, so 8 till 7, 1st of March to 31st of October and 8 till 4 from the 1st of November to the 28th or 29th of February. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, then. So uh, we'll open up to uh, debate. Uh, obviously, a fantastic new facility that we'll be receiving. Um, I have visited a few of these around the country, and they, they really do work well uh, compared to our current standard. So, uh, yeah, a win-win. And uh, Councillor Hamilton, uh, did anyone else want to... Oh, uh, Councillor Lawrence. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say that I, I met the officers there and I've done a site visit myself and uh, they showed me all around and this has been a long time overdue to be expanded and made new and everything I see looked pretty good and quite impressive and I also spoke to all the men who actually work there and it's going to be a better working environment for the employees, it's going to be safer for them and uh, I was very impressed by it all and the officers and all all the hard work that they've done and put into this. So after going there and actually speaking to everyone and speaking to the men what was sweeping up and telling them they should put face masks on to protect themselves, it's going to be a very nice area to go and it might make people want to go there a bit more and get rid of their rubbish. Okay, thank you. Councillor Rice. Uh, yes, Chair. Um, well, it's much welcomed because obviously we do need to recycle uh, our waste and um, this being our main site within the borough uh, this is excellent news for all residents and uh, I say we proceed to the vote Chair. Fantastic. Uh, Councillor Hamilton did you want to recommend 8.0 on page 146? I'm only going to say yes, I'm full recommendation. I wonder if there's going to be a gift shop. Uh, uh, seconded, uh, Councillor Lydiard. Okay, all those in favour of recommendations uh, 8.0 set out on page 146, please raise your hands. Okay, excellent. That's a unanimous across the committee, so we can say application reference 18 stroke 015 stroke 08 slash TVC um, Civic Amenity Site, Bucking Hill Road, has been approved. It's now 21.42, and that's the end of the meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. It's a good meeting. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers, Steve.